the best morning greetings to you, everybody, from the northeast corner of what is soon to be sunny South Africa. The dawn is just ignited there on the eastern horizon. This is Safari Live. Ready. Standing by. I'm led to believe it's about 11 degrees Celsius here. That is what the weather report says. The weather report, of course, a greater work of fiction normally than the Zimbabwean elections of 2008. Now, my name is James Hendry. On camera today is uh, Eggsy the hipster. Uh, Eggsy is sporting a very hipster watch this morning. Every day we think that he's losing his Cape Town hipster nature, but he, he doesn't disappoint with some uh, piece of accessorization. Uh, otherwise known as accessory, that shows he is still in the mind frame of Cape Town. Good morning, Eggsy. Good morning. There we are. Uh, on the other vehicle, Jamie Patterson is driving around. Uh, she's being filmed by the diminutive VM Dorenbrach, and they will, are going to look for Shadow, who they managed to find yesterday evening just before the close of drive. Our plan today is to go up here towards the east and then north to see if we can't pick up on the lions that were shouting possibly until, well, certainly until I fell asleep round about quarter past ten last night and then again this morning and Chris Rogue and a few others have noticed or certainly heard them calling on the dam cam during the course of the night. So they're somewhere around. Uh, whether they're on Juma still, I don't know. In case you're wondering what on earth this is, what you've stumbled across, who is this strangely garbed human talking to you on the internet on a live stream, you are on a live safari. That means exactly what it is. Uh, we're about to go on a drive through the middle of the Kruger National Park, a little section on the western fringes called Juma, uh, Cheetah Plains to the east and Arethusa to the west. And hopefully we'll see some of the spectacular creatures that we have here on offer. The only thing left for me to tell you is that you must please talk to us during the course of the next three hours. Hashtag Safari Live or questions at wildearth.tv and that will give you, uh, well, access to my ear. Uh, hopefully I'll be able to answer any questions that you have. If I can't, we'll ask Jamie, and if she can't, well, I doubt anyone can. In the final control today, uh, doing all of the sort of um, complicated mechanical stuff and vision mixing, uh, it's a pleasure to have Geraldine Cheesecake Kent in my ear and Kirsten McLennan-Smith on the keys. Let's go straight across to Jamie and find out how her shadow search is going. Good morning and welcome to another glorious day here in the African bush. My name is Jamie and I have Viam on camera with me with his hands wrapped up nice and snug and warm because although we're coming now to the end of winter there's still a little bit of a nip in the air whenever we set out first thing in the morning. So yesterday afternoon Viam and myself had a marvelous time out exploring basically the boundary of Juma and Arethusa which is our sort of the middle of our traverse area at this point. And we had Tingana up in, the, up in a tree with a kill. We had a ninja scrub hare that was trying to sneak away from us very, very slowly. And then we had a staring competition with the male lion who proceeded to give us a perfect example of the amazing sounds that a lion is capable of producing, roaring his way through to the end of the sunset safari. But our night was not over yet. We actually had this amazing experience where I was driving, starting to take us home. We'd left the male lion and I look in the ground and on top of every single person's vehicle tracks was a fresh, fresh, shiny set of female leopard tracks. So I said to Viam, who took the spotlight from me while I was concentrating on the tracks, she's here, we're going to see her. And lo and behold, we came around a corner. Oh my goodness, that's very bumpy here. We came around the corner and there was Shadow. Well, actually, there was an Impala, a very unsuspecting Impala, and there was Shadow right behind it, flat to the ground, and proving to be as elusive as she always is, she decided to pop out at the end of the Sunset Safari. I immediately just killed all of my lights and left the area. I don't, I don't think her cub was there, but because she was hunting and because I didn't know, I decided I would leave her be. 
and let her get on with her nightly adventures. And so, my mission for this morning is to go back, see whether she managed to catch those impala, and to see whether or not we can find her, because she's proved, she has proved to be particularly elusive over the last few days. I'm hoping that we get a chance to see her. Shadow, by the way, is a female leopard who has a five-month-old cub. And so what we're doing now is we've come to the boundary of Juma and Arethusa, a road called Triple M, and it's the first place I want to check because it's a main road. It's a, an access road for all of the lodges from the gate, which means that there's lots and lots of vehicle traffic on it as soon as the morning gets going. So I wanted to beat everybody out here. Kind of the early bird catches the worm principle, except it's the early guide sees the leopard kind of deal. Totally different expression, or at least the early guide gets the tracks. And I'm hoping we might see whether or not she came back across. The fact that she wasn't with her cub and that she'd lost a kill from Tingana on Arethusa and Simbombili, to me, means that if she was successful, there's a good chance she would have had to go back and get her little girl and go back with her. And that's one of the best ways to find a female leopard, is when they've got a kill and they've got cubs, they walk a pathway to go fetch the cubs and then you'll find their tracks going back almost on top of their tracks, the opposite direction. And that is what I'm hoping for this morning. Now, all in all, exciting things planned for the day ahead. And good morning to Rachel. It is so lovely to have you on board. And Rachel is a new viewer who is joining us. I'm not sure if it's for the first time, but it's definitely the first time I've had a question come through from Rachel. Rachel wants to know, do we do this just to check up on the animals? To an extent, it is that will serve one of the purposes if we find that there is some kind of problem with them, whether it is a snare or not that that never, hardly ever happens, but it did happen once where a young male leopard caught a domestic or a stray dog that had wandered onto this property and because we'd seen it, we could report it immediately and he was immediately put into quarantine and then has been released eight months later. And Rachel, that's a long story. But it's an example of one of the things that we can do because it turned out that that stray dog had rabies. Now, the leopard had a very, very lucky escape because the guides happened to be there. Most of the guides in this area do this to take tourists around so that they get to see and experience the magic of the African bush. That in turn brings in money, which in turn pays for the conservation efforts. And it's not a running a, a reserve like this one is not a cheap experience. There's all kinds of things that go into it behind the scenes that we don't realize, or that perhaps you don't realize. Fence patrols, anti-poaching, maintaining fences, maintaining roads, everything like that costs money. And just again, making it for South Africa, tourism is one of our biggest industries. If we didn't have reserves like this, that made money for the, the communities and created jobs, there's a chance it would be turned into farmland. So that's why, that's how, what an important role tourism actually plays out here. What we do is completely different. What we do, I'm stopping here because otherwise it's going to run away from us, right next to the power lines. Look at this lovely little dacre picking its way through in the morning light. Rachel, what we do I think is different but equally important. Uh, because this is live, it allows us to bring what I feel is probably the truest reflection of wildlife to people who either can't go on safari um, for whatever means that may be or perhaps they have been on safari but they obviously can't keep coming back to South Africa so they can enjoy the experience each and every day but it's also a far more complete way of experiencing the bush because you can follow an animal's stories for years and years and years and some of our viewers have they have come to know each and every individual leopard personally. And why is that important? Well, first of all, documentaries, no matter how ethically they're made, are edited and scripted. We can't do that here, obviously, because the animals dictate the story. And second of all, for me, the most important thing that I feel that we do is that we help people to fall in love with the African bush and hopefully become invested in its future and protect it. And for me, that particularly lies with the school drives that we do, because of course, as we know, the future of the world lies in the hands of the children. 
So for me, to, especially to take kids who have never seen, had an opportunity to see stuff like this to inspire, and now I'm going to sound a little bit like Hayden Turner, who of course, that of course is absolutely fine, it's a wonderful thing, but to actually spark that interest in children and to get them to love and appreciate nature as it is, I think is the main purpose of what we do. And we're basically emulating a safari experience because you can ask your questions. <laughs> Red is curious about our unicorn. <laughs> Red wants to know if it has one horn. It doesn't, Red. It's a female dacre, but what it has, although it makes it look like a unicorn, is a mohawk. That's, oh no, look, it's a, it's a young male. Sorry. It's a young male. I'm not sure if you could see that. It's got two tiny little horns sticking up on either side of the mohawk. The mohawk is meant to look like a horn. It's meant to look scary. <clears throat> I don't know about you. I'm pretty intimidated. So that's a young male. It's actually got two horns on either side and then the little mohawk so it's hair sticking up out of the top of its head. We're going to continue on and search for Shadow. I'm really, really hopeful that she was successful last night and we finally get to see her with her cub. In the meantime, let's find out how James's lion search is going. Well, my lion search is not going fantastically well, I have to say. I haven't found any tracks. I have heard no lions. The sun is about to peep up over the eastern horizon. And I'm just going to turn off here and let's have a little bit of a listen to the dawn chorus. We might also find a bird or two to look at. I saw a chin spot batis flying through here. Unfortunately, Eggsy didn't see it. It's not Eggsy's fault, everybody. Most things are his fault, but this particular incident is not. Okay, let's have a listen for 10 seconds. Let's have a listen for another 10 seconds, now that we have the microphone up. It really is yet another very quiet morning, everyone. There are a couple of crombecks calling. Way in the distance, a grey-headed bushrike. One or two drongos in the distance and perhaps a franklin, but otherwise it is almost silent. That of course will change as we go towards the summer. Righty, let us move on. So we're on the northern boundary now. There's a mixed flock of completely indescribable birds. Very nice. Um, I, uh, what they could have been, everyone, is a mixed flock of what we of widers. Now you know those ones with the long tails, the Eastern Paradise wider that has a long tail, looks like a little finch. Well, the interesting thing is, of course, in winter they're almost indistinguishable because they look like the females. They lose that very obvious coloration, and now, as we move towards September, as the days get slightly longer, so the coloration of summer, just like a weaver bird will come back and I'm hoping that when the great predicted deluge ensues we will actually have some yellow weavers to show you this year. Not one that I see nesting last year during our drought. Now Brent and Jamie tracked the lions into this block on our right hand side there where my hand is pointing. It is impossible to drive in there but we might be lucky and find tracks of the lions coming out, either going north, which will make us sad and possibly cry, or, with any luck, uh, on the road, or at Bivelshoek Dam. So that's where we're going to go and see what we can find. I'm astounded we still have signal through this little dip. That's marvellous news. And possibly an appropriate time to introduce of course, uh, you to the fact that we are not alone on this drive, are we, Eggsy? No, we are not. We have the presence of the anonymous one, a.k.a. Connor Teagues. He of the very empty stomach. 
Connor doesn't like to be on camera, everybody. He's an engineer. <laughs> Egg, Eggsy's going to be in big trouble later. Hello, Tony in Pennsylvania. It's a very appropriate question for this time of the year. You say, what kind of temperature change do we go through during the course of a day? Um, Tony, we go through a temperature change at this time of the year, I think is probably the greatest, sorry, just one second. It started off at 9 degrees Celsius yesterday morning, apparently. It's a bush. And I think it got a lot colder than that in some of the dips, probably down to about 5 degrees Celsius, which is not much more than 40, 41 degrees or so Fahrenheit. But then... In the middle of the day yesterday, I, I checked my car, I was getting something, and it was 27 degrees Celsius, which is um, 79, 79, almost 80 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's about, I think this time of the year, probably the greatest temperature differential. So let's say it went down to 5, that's 22 degrees Celsius, which is quite a lot. Then yesterday, at least not yesterday, in the middle of summer, when it is uh, pushing say on a really hot day it'll be 45 degrees celsius here so just over 100 degrees fahrenheit that's a really hot day and then but in it won't drop below sort of um probably won't drop below 26 at night so it doesn't change a great deal during the summer it's just universally beastly hot Right, we're going down a very bumpy road now, everybody, so hold on tight. Don't spill your coffee on your laps. If you have dentures, a good idea to remove them now. Put them next to you. Don't drop them on the floor, obviously. That would be disgusting. Hello, space thing. Space thing, you say? Is that really your name? Space thing, you say you're looking forward to seeing these lions. I too am looking forward to seeing these lions. I do hope we see them. I haven't seen any tracks just yet. So they were in the block off there to the right hand side of where we are now, yesterday. But of course we do know lions move quite a lot during the course of the night. But they do have littly ones with them, which means they won't move quite as far as they might have otherwise. Hello, D. Smith. Good morning to you. I hope you have a... Well, please do tell us where you are from. So I hope you're having a good evening or morning, wherever you happen to be. And that just goes for everybody. It's so nice to hear where you're from when we talk to you. Um, D. Smith, that has got nothing to do with what you wanted to know. You wanted to know about the lions. You say you've been to the Tembe Elephant Park, which is a park, everybody, in the northeast corner of what we call Hazulu Natal. So on the southern Mozambican border, uh, famous for its elephants. That's why it's called the Elephant Park, Exi. Um, and you say the lions there are a slightly different color. What color was that, Jerry? P-A-U-P-E, P-A-U-P-E, I don't know what that means. Oh, tort, torp, tawny as opposed to golden. Um, uh, D, I don't know, to be honest, why they'd be a slightly different color, but for the fact that the soil there is much redder than it is here. There's a lot more iron in the soil. In fact, there's a lot more nutrition in the soil generally in that part of the world. So I think what you'll find is that they pick up the dust. Um, they are the same species. In fact, I'm almost certain that the lions of Tembe Elephant Park are, in fact, Kruger lions. I don't believe that they are anything other than Kruger lions that were reintroduced to that area, um, as are most of the lions on many of the private reserves that are not connected to the Kruger. So, you know, they would have been darted and taken from a place like this. I'm now going to move the stick, everybody. 
I hope I won't embarrass myself. We might have to get Connor's big muscles involved. Luckily, my small ones sufficed this time round. Connor's most relieved. He went pale for a second there. I plug myself back in. Can't do that with my gloves on. Okay, here we go. This is a very, very pleasant morning at the moment. It really does have a feeling of expectation now as we head towards the spring. Just little tendrils of flowers coming out on the knobthorn trees. One or two guari bushes with their sort of subtle lily scented flowers. But uh, unfortunately no lion tracks at this stage. A watting contest? Oh, very good question. Um, <laughs> Aqua, you want to know who would win an eating competition between Connor and Jamie? Jamie is impressive, I've got to tell you, she can eat a lot. Uh, and uh, with seemingly no effect on her body whatsoever. Connor, I'm afraid though, wins hands down. If I was in camp yesterday doing some things, you know, I wasn't out on drive, and you know, every three minutes or so you'd hear the clink of cutlery and crockery, and that would be Connor emerging from his room to have another snack. A bowl of cereal, perhaps some fruit, a tin of tuna, a leftover piece of pork belly from lunch, plate of yogurt, a chocolate, something like that. Banana, fruit, yeah. <laughs> or one of the supplements he has in his room. I think he takes them mainly because they make him feel less hungry. <laughs> it's quite nice having the camera here because it's a, it's a barrier beyond which he won't he won't pass, so I can basically insult him at will, and he won't um, he won't come past it to meet out physical trauma on me until it, he knows we're not live. I may just pretend to be live for the rest of the day. Now, people, I cannot find any sign of the lion, so we're going to go to Biffleshook Dam. We'll have a look around there. I suspect I would have seen the tracks crossing here because it's a big pride. While I do that, let's go across to Jamie and get an update on how her shadow tracking is going. I hear there has been much discussion around our eating habits. Certainly Connor and myself, I think, have earned a little bit of a reputation around camp in terms of the amount that we eat. I'll say I'm willing to concede that Connor eats more than I do. Just in terms of, as James said, that constant snacking. I'm just going to pull over and let poor Sean come past me because I'm driving roughly at the rate of a snail. So let me just let him come through. Oh, we're still on the lookout for Shadow. She hasn't crossed Triple M. Cheers. Enjoy. Thanks very much. Please, yeah. Cool. Thank you very much. Sean and his wonderful tracker, Reef. Reef and I have had some wonderful long conversations about where the different animals are and what's happening and what he thinks is going on with Shadow and so on. So she hasn't crossed... Oh, I need to sneeze, sorry. We're now trailing behind Sean and his dust cloud. It's stuck. And there's no sun for me to look at. Right, anyway, so she hasn't crossed Triple M, which is good. That was the first place I wanted to start, was to check the main road, because that's the, as I said this morning, that's the first place people are going to drive, and the first place they're going to drive over tracks, especially transfer vehicles and so on, bringing people into the lodges. They don't know what to look for, and they don't know what, what they're doing in terms of driving over tracks, and then we have a devastating morning where you spend ages scratching around one area, and it turns out the animal's on the completely opposite side of the reserve. The Arethusa guides and some of the guides in the west are also quite jealous we've had so many lions. 
And Natasha? I think Natasha's on the same page we all are, which is that she would love to see a shadow in Zara. Zara, of course, is the unofficial name that James... Hyena? Yeah, no. No. Sorry. Natasha, we'll get back... Okay, cool. Perfect. Thank you. I trust VM's judgment call completely in terms of him being able to see that side as well, which also helps. I'm far too short. And Natasha said she wants to see Shadow and Zara. I do too. I really, really, really do too. It feels like it's been an incredibly long time since we last saw the cub that is unofficially called Zara. I quite like the name Zara. But it um, all stems from James's James's tendency to name the, the royal lineage of Karula after the royal family. Of course, for a long time, Karula's cubs' unofficial names were George and Charlotte. And Shadow, as the daughter of Karula, and therefore have Zara, therefore the little one is Karula's granddaughter, has been called Zara. Anyway, her name is not officially Zara. She probably we managed to speed up the process of the naming of Karula's cubs. Generally, <coughs> a leopard out here will not get its name until it is a year old, at which point its chances of survival dramatically increase. But we were able to expedite that process when it came to the naming of Karula's cubs just because we were concerned that unofficial names might start to stick and there would be confusion, as there was with Sindile who then became Medibo, who then became Medib Sindila again, and all got very confusing. But Shadow, I think her cub will probably remain without an official name until she's a year old. Checking this junction very carefully. And Christopher in Arizona, lovely to hear from you. Christopher's asked a question that I can't answer, which is, has Sindile given up on trying to reconnect with Shadow? My instinct, Christopher, is that no, he hasn't, not yet. And that's borne out by the update that Harry's given us. He is moving. He's moving long distances and he's moving under pressure because he's a young male leopard and that's what they do. They, they seek a vacuum somewhere where they can feel safe and secure once they disperse. However, he has spent, because we only, get the, we only get the GPS points, so we can't, we don't know where he's moved in the time in between those GPS points. And to me, it seems as though he's spent a lot of time in what is known as his natal range, where he was born, the place that he knows, and the place that Shadow is spending a lot more time in. Whether or not that means he is trying to reconnect with his mom still, I don't know. My, he's a young male, he's not quite... He, He's coming up to two years old now. Hello, Impala. I don't suppose you've seen a leopard in your long, dark evening. All bright red and fluffy. I don't think this is the herd that she was hunting last night. I think that herd is a little bit further to the north. But you never know. He was definitely targeting the Impala. And both Shadow and Karula have done exceptionally well recently in terms of hunting and catching adult Impala, which for a leopard, a female leopard, is no mean feat. They weigh just a little, little bit more than the Impala, and the Impala are very strong and very fast. But what that does mean is that, especially for Shadow, who's always seemed to have a little bit of a problem lifting things into trees, or hoisting them, as we call it officially. It does mean for Shadow that she's lost quite a few kills recently as well. Oh, young males, a lovely mixture of a breeding herd here. We've got a complete switch in the last two months from when the males were still chasing the females around. We had the bachelor groups all on their own, and then the females with one big ram that was keeping them corralled and chasing them around and making lots and lots of noise. The noise has died down. Every now and again one male gets a bit confused and starts chasing females for a little bit or fighting with another male. But for the most part, the breeding season is over and it's time for... Oh, hold on. Having just said that... <laughs> oh. That was relatively anticlimactic. 
Looked like the two young males were going to have a little bit of a scrap. They've decided breakfast is far more important. And I'm actually going to leave our impala and keep going. Christopher, I don't know. I, we don't really know the answer to your question about whether or not Sandile is still trying to reconnect with Shadow. From his tracks, in the last two weeks, uh, two weeks ago, he seemed to be spending a lot of time where Shadow's tracks were, but we, we miss so much of their day-to-day -day lives that I, we can only guess at what kind of interactions they're having. And Aaron in Scotland, lovely to have you on board with us. Aaron wants to know how old the leopard is that we are talking about. And since I've glossed over so many leopards, let's just go one by one. Shadow is the daughter, the oldest daughter of Karula, alongside her twin sister Tundi. She is now close to 10 years old. In fact, she must be very close to 10 years old at this point. Her cub is six or no, five ish months old. And. Sindile is coming up to two years old at this point. In fact, he must be very close to two. If not, he, he might even be two, two years old already. Somewhere around here that he turned... No, he's coming up to two years old. Sorry. I had a bit of a confusion about where we are in the year. But we're in August, so he can't quite be two just yet. And bear with me one second. I'm just going to hop on the game drive comms. And then I'll explain a little bit further. Oh, morning, I know that uh, James is trying to follow up on Ingala around Gary Cut Line. I'm checking Zoe's Triple M to see if there's any sign of shadow from where she crossed in last night. There was also a report of one fuzzy Ingwe on the dam camera around early yesterday evening. Okay, copy that, thanks. I've checked Triple M, but I've only checked Gary Main up until Zoe's Road, so I haven't checked the rest of it. We're just planning our search and the way that we're going to approach the morning. Make sure that we spread our attention so that we don't end up checking the same places and we can spread out as efficiently as possible. So and for Aaron, and for our new viewers like Rachel, it gets a bit confusing. And don't worry, I know that our regular viewers are always ready to jump on board and explain exactly how everything works and has unfolded. But essentially, Karula has been a very, very successful mother. She's a female leopard that is dominant in Juma and the surrounding area. But as with most female leopards, she's given portion of her territories to her two daughters, to Shadow and Tundi. Shadow has had far less success than her mother in terms of raising cubs. Her last cub was Sindile, who was the one that caught the dog, the rabbit dog, and ended up in quarantine. <coughs> and she now has one little cub called, well, unofficially called Zara, standing by. Just, this is where she was hunting the impala. Let's just check very, very carefully. I have this dream that one day I'm going to come around the corner that she's going to be in that big Balanites tree, which I'll show you in a moment. Oh, that would have changed things. And I'll show you what I mean, which is interesting because that wasn't the direction he was going in last night, but that definitely would have changed things. <laughs> Not tracks of a female leopard, but a much, much larger cat. And that's the male lion that we were with yesterday. Exactly where I left her. Now I'm just taking my earpiece out for a second. I want to try and figure out exactly what happened here. 
It's a pity because if she did make a kill last night and that male lion walked past, there is a very, very good chance that he would have stolen it from her and there'd be no evidence remaining, particularly with an impala. He probably would have taken it from her if he'd found her. But leopards, like, well, leopards especially, very, very good at remaining hidden and subtle in their ways. So the male lion, which was going, he was going in completely the opposite direction. He was close close to here when we left him but he wasn't going this way this is his track here this is the back of his foot and his toes going off towards the southern section of the reserve this is exactly where we saw shadow pretty much exactly this is where we saw the impala that she was hunting she was flat and crouched behind that termite mound over there Okay, our search just became slightly harder, but that's okay, never to be deterred by a challenge. We will carry on and see if we can't figure out exactly where it is that she's gone. Oh my goodness, my earpiece has done a complicated thing here. There we go. I'm surprised. It's not where I expected that male lion to go, but he must have heard something that attracted his attention. And now we drive at a snail's pace, so as not to miss a hint of what occurred here. Poor Shadow would have been very unimpressed with that, although we don't know what time he walked past. Speaking of our leopards and the different, they're the impala that were here last night, sorry. They're quite far into the vegetation, but you can just see the streaks of red there and some movement. So those are the impala that we saw last night. I can almost guarantee that. Ah. Hmm. Goodness, figuring out where she's going to go. As I said, I would love one day it will happen that I come around the corner and there's a leopard in this tree, rather than Brent or James, who seem to have a special affinity for climbing it. But one day there will be a leopard in there, staring down at us from the comfort of its branches. Hasn't happened yet, but it has to at some point. <laughs> Statistically, if we drive past this tree enough times, at some point there's going to be a leopard there. Mara Lee, talking about leopards, are there enough male leopards to produce offspring with the different females around the area that are not related to them? Yes, there are for now. Um, Tingana is not related to Kurula or to Shadow or to Tundi. And he is the dominant male that mates with them. Of course, they do mate with different males in the area. However, a little bit of inbreeding amongst cats does happen every now and again, the big cats. Um, sometimes the females mate with, the f uh, with their fathers or however it happens to play out and that's okay for one or two generations it's not ideal but it's absolutely okay and it doesn't harm the cats at all I'm going to keep checking this very very carefully in fact I'm actually probably going to get off and go for a walk uh, while I do that let's go across to James and find out how his tracking adventures are going We found some lion tracked everybody, a male and a female, looks like a mating pair, quite possibly Amber Eyes and her consort. They came down Central Road and then they went off north towards Bifoshook Dam. We haven't got there yet and so we're on our way round. They may or may not be sort of secluded or secreted up in this drainage system over here. Perhaps um, they have found some privacy over there because Amber Eyes has been sort of 
half-heartedly mating now. Uh, pro this is probably the fourth time we've seen her try and uh, conceive. It's obviously not a conscious process, or it doesn't seem to be. It's purely instinctual based on the hormones that are coursing through her body. So maybe she will give birth this time. And I'm pretty sure that there were three of the are uh, three with cubs. Pretty sure the other is pregnant, and I think Amber Eyes remains the only one that isn't at the moment. You can see what tracks are those there? Ooh, ooh. Right, Sarah. So, we have tracks of a female lion, which I shall show you once I've checked that she isn't about to devour me from behind the bush as I get out of the car. And as I get out of the car, just listen to the white brow's crab robin calling there. Can you see down here, Eddie? Not there. How hopeless. I thought I'd given you enough space. Can you see here, Iggsy? Here's the track, everyone. A possibly amber eyes. The two of them. There and there. And she's obviously moving that way. Can you see the track at all? Not really. Not much contrast in the light, I'm afraid. But it's about the size of the palm of my hand. I don't have a very big hand. But a male is substantially larger, about the size of my whole hand. So I think this is the same lioness that's popped out here. She came in the drainage system and popped out on the road here. Let's see where she goes. I'm not convinced that they're that fresh. I think they're probably from yesterday evening sometime. And of course they can go very far. Right here, on we go. I'm just listening to the Game Drive channel. It is on open communication, so if you hear a voice, it's not because you're going mad, it's because you're hearing the, uh, the Game Drive channel. She's still going straight along the road here. Just make sure that it is, in fact. It is. It's... Don't see any cubs. Oh, but there's a male lion going the other way. That's not fresh. No, she's turned round here. No, she hasn't. It's fine. Okay. Let us hope we're lucky. We have seen one or two Nyala. What? My earpiece. Is she talking to me, Eggsy? What is she saying? Geraldine, go ahead. Sorry, I do apologize. I didn't plug myself in. <laughs> Hello, Sue in the UK. You ask a very good question, <laughs> to which I suspect you'll be fairly surprised by the answer. You say your son wants to become a ranger. What's the first step? And do you have to be have some acting skills to be a presenter? Um, I'm going to answer the first question first. The second one is rather amusing. Um, Sue, the first question is. She's turned around here. We didn't miss her, did we, Iggy? Connor, have you been looking for the lion? Okay, let's just carry on around the corner here and see if that's not where they did turn around. Sue, there's a difference between a ranger and a guide. A ranger ostensibly is somebody who um, does much more of the conservation work. They do land management, they'll maintain roads in an area like this, they'll patrol for poachers, and they spend their time in the field doing actual kind of conservation work. Then you get a sort of, uh, then you get what I trained to be, which is a guide. I train to do both, but guiding is essentially what we're doing now. And for that, you can do various courses around here, but basically, if you want to be a good guide, the main criterion 
is that you like people. Um, if you want to be a guide, it's essentially, it's a human job. It's not a wildlife job. I know people think of it as a wildlife job, but it's a human job that you do in the bush. And yes, of course, you have to be interested in nature, but it's largely a, a personal interaction job. Then the job that I'm doing now, I don't think it requires acting skills. Um, I'll tell you why. It's because it's not... We're not really acting so much as we are presenting, and acting by its very nature is inauthentic if you know what I mean so if, if I was acting now um, I think whoops I think you'd <laughs> like I wasn't acting there I nearly fell out the car um, I think you'd find that acting for something like this would come across very forced so it's very much an authentic thing but it is a question of um, enjoying presenting enjoying being in front of the camera and so I suppose an enjoyment of acting would be helpful but I don't think you need to be a skillful actor to do what we do. So Sue, the first step would be for your son to probably do um, some kind of biological qualification. If he's got the intellectual capacity and want, then I would send him off to do biology at university for three years or so. Um, but he doesn't have to do that. But it's probably a good idea. And then you come out here and you can do any number of courses. Uh, some of them particularly poor, some good ones, so do your research thoroughly. And he can either become a guide, um, or in one of the private reserves here, uh, hundreds of them, and I know that there are a lot of uh, foreign, I mean, uh, seems strange saying foreign, but yes, there are a lot of foreign people doing guiding right now. In fact, the um, head ranger of Londolozi just down the road is from Bermuda. So there are lots of different nationalities driving around the South African low field as guides so you can do that if he wants to do real conservation work game ranging um, you know walking the bush patrolling maintaining fences and that sort of stuff well then he's going to have to do um, a little bit or very diff different training that's a bit more difficult to find and the best way to do that I think is probably to find a, a mentor some kind of experienced game ranger who can point him in the right direction so that's, in a long-winded way, uh, your son's best option, I suppose. To do what I do now, versus just sort of standard issue guiding, um, is... Well, I'm still plugged in. Is... Um, requires, a, I would say, at least three years of experience. Just because you have to talk about quite a lot of stuff because you do have a very experienced group of people on the back of the car. I'm just going to call these tracks in. Stations, tracks of this female line came out on um, Drakensberg Road between Central and Gwari Pan. She walked north for a while, then turned around and walked back south. I'm just going to check the horse of dam and then I'll go back into that area. There we go. My duty is done. Taxon and Aubrey are coming around in this area, so they'll help me. Hello, Black Rose. A very good question from you, a very astute question. You say, have we ever thought about doing this around the world in different places? Absolutely. Um, it's in the pipeline. The thing is, it does, um, of course, take quite a substantial amount of funding to set up an operation like this all over the, you know, in the different wildlife hotspots of the world. A uh, certain amount of infrastructure and that sort of thing. And I mean, this has taken a long time to set up. And I mean, while we're not near perfect, I think we've probably got an idea of the, t oh, I say we, uh, I mean the people who actually know what they're talking about. Um, we have a, we've got a, a, the technical know-how now to probably be able to do it in most places. And we are going, we're experimenting in different parts. You know that Brent went up to Rwanda to do a test there. Uh, we might be going to Kenya fairly soon to do a test there. Just very much a test though. There's no going to, you know, we'll so the, the idea is to expand into other areas. much, much warmer than yesterday.
<laughs> I don't know, Doug in Arizona, you say, you say that um, you've been watching since 2005, well thank you very much for that, and that the guides are constantly complaining about the temperature and that's probably not a very good thing for tourism. Um, I think it's more commenting than complaining. Uh, this low felt area that we're in here has got probably the best temperature or best climate in the country, especially as far as the winter goes. It's the most magnificent way to spend a winter. Clear blue skies for three months at a time. Uh, very pleasant temperatures in the middle of the day. Uh, I suppose, Doug, it's um, got to do with the you know chilly morning and you know something to talk about. It's, uh, it's, it's all around us, the weather, all the time. So I think that's why we talk about it as much as we do. Um, I don't mean to complain. I do apologize if that's how it's coming across. <laughs> but I promise you the climate here is del delightful. Now, we are approaching the dam, but I don't see further tracks here. I wonder if they didn't go to the dam and then leave it again after a drink of the muddy water. And some elephant tracks fresh on the end of World Elephant Day yesterday. We don't have a World Day. I'm sure it is a World Day of something today, but it's not elephants. And of course yesterday we found out that um, the 14th of October is World Eggs Day. And since then, Eggsy has been unable to speak. He's been so excited with his plans for what he's going to do on the 14th of October. It's like a second birthday for him now. Eggsy, when is your when is your real birthday? End of March. End of March. Two birthdays in one year. Lucky you. Kathy in Tennessee, you've noticed how different the bush looks. So if Eggsy pans off to the right-hand side, if you don't mind, Eggsy, I don't mean to trouble you, you know, I know you're very comfortable on the back there. Um, you can see there that we can see into, don't worry too much about the quality of the shot. You can see that we can see into the bush, and Kathy, you say that's because the elephants have pushed things over. It is to some extent, Kathy, but it's also because of the fact that the elephants have, well, I mean, the the season has denuded the trees of their leaves which means it does look um, it does look a bit more open but that said yes when we go into the summer it will become a lot thicker and you say how long will it take before we I think sort of before the bush recovers if you like from the elephant damage it, it, it doesn't ever recover because it's in a constant state of flux so it's not actually damaged it's um, it's much more it's it's much more just in a constant state of flux and the drier it is the more trees will be pushed over and then we'll have these wet seasons and the trees will come up and some of them are quite fast growing but I don't think that this place will ever look the same one year to the next there will always be a subtle difference right let's have a look here at the water's edge Well, there is absolutely nothing going on, Eggsy. Do you see that? Some Egyptian geese shouting at each other. Connor told me very confidently as he got on the car today that he always has good luck. Well, look where that is today, Connor. I can just see something shining through there. I look through there with my binoculars. It is very bright, of course, because we're staring straight into the sun. Hang on a second, everybody. I'll get it right eventually. One doesn't want to just put the binoculars willy-nilly to one's eyes when staring due east into the morning sun. One will become blinded. I just thought I may have seen the white underside of a lion's belly, but I have not. All righty, well, we turn around and keep trying with fortitude. Is 
hang on. There are the Egyptian geese. I think they're probably going to fly back over here. Here, 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 here. There are four of them. Four angry Egyptian geese coming over. <laughs> They're so very cross with each other. No, let's turn around here. And we'll carry on down back towards where those lion tracks were. I think they're from last night, so I don't think they're that fresh. But we might find her lying up somewhere or perhaps devouring a buffalo. We know also, of course, that there was a leopard scene at the Juma Dam Cam last night. So we might be lucky and pick up tracks of Karula and her little ones a little bit later. Who knows? As the old cliche goes, you never know what's going to be around the next corner. Hello Sandy, you want me to drive past where we saw the injured buffalo ye yesterday? Um, uh, I'm afraid I can't because I don't know where that was, but Jamie can, I think. She was probably quite close to where it was yesterday, and uh, yeah, it would be a good idea to find out if he, if he was, uh, if, if he's still around, or if he has shaken off this mortal coil. It's interesting, you know. Jamie reckoned that was a different buffalo from the one that we saw being attacked the other day, and I think she may well be correct. But we didn't find that one that we saw being attacked the other day uh, around the Galago Pan. The four lionesses seem to have almost uh, killed him when he, they got too tired. They eventually just got too tired and left him alone. But he had blood all over him. He had been raked to pieces. He had bite marks all over his back. And we didn't see him again the next day. So that was either the same buffalo or another buffalo that suffered a similar fate that managed to escape the lions just through the fact that he's so big that the lions become tired. And I think it's... Uh, Four lionesses on one buffalo bull is a pretty even match. So sometimes they'll succeed, but ideally they'd want to have a male with them. He's just that much stronger. Let's pop up onto the top here and I want you to have another listen to the dawn chorus. Well now there's male lion track going down this way, but they are not fresh. Ooh. Female going back the way. <laughs> it's all rather confusing. I think this is the same female that we had pop out there, and she's turned around and she's gone back. While I try and figure out what's going on here, everybody, let's go across to Jamie and get an update from her. For now, we have temporarily put our search for Shadow on hold. I did find your tracks, but we'll come back to that in a moment. We've just got a report that wild dogs have come racing across from Simbombili onto Juma. And now it's up to us to try and figure out exactly where they have gone. They've come through to Impala Plains area to stop and have a look and just see what the animals are doing. We've got one... we had one lone female Impala. I don't know where she's gone now. We've also got some kudu who look relatively relaxed, but the female impala did not. She looked terrified. She was breathing fast. She looked a lot like an impala does when they've just run away from wild dogs. They are alert. They're not completely relaxed. They keep looking off in that direction. Okay, we can't, we can't stop for too long. We can't delay for too long. Wild dogs are fast. So, uh, sorry, lovely kudu. Sorry, 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 sorry. Did he come through? Hey, girl. Are they... Well, there you go. This is for Love Three Dogs, who is asking for an update on where the wild dogs are. This is, from what we know, this is the three of them from the lower, the remaining members of the lower Sabi pack that have come, been spending a lot of time in this area. 
nothing is known about the den site in Ottawa of the Sands Pack. So we actually don't have that many updates on our usual wild dog packs that we see. We see two, the Sands Pack and the Investic Pack. And then occasionally we get breakaway packs or something similar. Okay, I wonder, oh goodness, which way is going to be best? I think let's take away Taylor main access and try and race along here. It's a tricky thing finding these wild dogs. They don't sit still, especially this time in the morning. They're looking for food. Let's try and find that impala herd that that female came from because they'll tell us a little bit about where we should start looking. So love three dogs. I wish I had more to tell you, but it seems as though at least the three of them have come running through to this direct in this direction. And wild dogs are so exciting. We get incredibly excited whenever we hear that there are wild dogs in the area. They're fast. They're incredibly endangered, critically endangered, and very, very special animals. They're exciting. They get the heart racing. And animals around here, things like impala, they don't even bother to alarm call when they see wild dogs. There's no time for that. It's just, just run. Just run and hope that they don't attract their, their attentions or that they're the lucky ones this time. Because wild dogs are not like lions or leopards. They don't try and sneak up on their prey and then ambush them. They run them down. They course through the bush until something runs away in front of them and then they go racing after it, chasing it down with their incredible stamina and their speed. And they just keep running until the animal that they're chasing or pursuing can't run any further. There's some impala here. I don't see any panic-stricken tracks on the road. Often you can see whether or not an impala has been galloping off along a road. There's another lone female impala. I think we're on the right track. Let's go to Sydney's Dam. Unless they've caught something. But we should, if they've caught something in this area, we should hear the twittering, yelping sounds that wild dogs make while they're feeding. And we should have heard that by now. I think they're going to Buffalo's cut line. I'm just... There's a special feel to the air when a wild dog has come through. I haven't smelt them yet, but it is a little bit windy today, so they, I might miss this, the wind might blow the smell away. Wild dogs are really, really distinctive in terms of the scent that they give off. It smells a lot like, I don't know, wet, a little bit like wet dog, wet, very dirty dog. I love that smell. It's not an unpleasant smell. It's a smell that spells excitement. Tina, lovely question coming through from you, which is wondering whether or not they would be vaccinated against canine distemper, this particular group, since that is what killed the rest of the pack. Tina, I don't know the full details into what plan they are implementing, but I do know that there were plans being put forward to vaccinate all of the wild dogs of an area. I believe that the ones in the Sabi Sand are vaccinated against canine distemper. That being said, I've just recently read of a wild dog pack in the Kalahari on a lovely place called Swalu and those poor wild dogs had just been introduced, vaccinated against canine distemper and they died of canine distemper anyway. So it's not 100% effective but yes there are plans to vaccinate the dogs. It's a difficult one, it's one of those areas where we really do step in and interfere to an extent because canine distemper is naturally occurring. And I say that because those dogs on Swalu are so far away from any kind of stray dog that they must have contracted it from something like a jackal or a bat eared fox. They cannot have contracted it from a domestic dog. But we interfere in this, in this particular instance because wild dogs are so critically endangered and they're so critically endangered because of human actions. I'm going to keep searching to try and figure out where these animals have gone. While we do, let's go back to James and find out what life is like at Buffles Hook Dam. 
I'm very confused, everybody. There are lion tracks going up and down all over the place, and I'm afraid I've got no idea what their sort of final termination point will be. We're going to keep looking, but in the meantime, some beautiful kudu heading into Torchwood, which is the reserve to the east of us. We are now on the far eastern fringes of Juma. And a nice little herd of two or three females and a young bull. And they're quite well hidden there in amongst the leaves of the round-leafed teak. And we were talking about the elephants and the change that they make to the vegetation here. And you can see very clearly that the bushes here, the round leaf teak, is maintained at that height by the elephants here. In the absence of elephants, these funny scraggly bushes that you're looking at now grow into big trees like the marula tree you can see there. Exi, we still have a kudu over there, you'll see. You'll see that down there. It's the one with the ears again. Yeah, that's it. It's in the sun. Yeah, that's the one. <laughs> Beautifully backlit by the golden copper of the sun shining through the round leaf teak. Exi, I might be tempted to take a photograph. No, not anymore. The picture's going to be interrupted slightly here. Uh, alrighty, there's a lovely kudu picture, but Jamie has got a flying... what it <laughs> described as the other day? Uh, death in the sky. That's a very dramatic description of a lovely bird, but I suppose that's very true. And actually, Viam just said to me earlier that he enjoys filming eagles because they are like the cats of the sky. I guess that does make total sense. I'm just having a look at this particular eagle. I've stopped, actually, because sometimes birds of prey will actually follow behind the wild dogs to pick up any scraps that they know might be around. And in this case, this particular bird might be no different. It is a dark, tawny eagle, from what I can see. With its, I can't see if it's got a yellowish eye. It does seem to have a dark eye. So my guess is it's a dark, tawny eagle. They come in lots and lots of different colors. Almost. It's the, the one other bird that you could confuse it with is a steppe eagle. But the steppe buzzards and the steppe eagles have not yet... Well, they might have started, but they have not yet completed their migration back to South Africa from all the way from Russia and Europe. So a tawny eagle surveying the air around, or the land around him, and silence. There's not, now there's not an impala, there's not a kudu, there's not one thing around us. No tracks. I don't know where these wild dogs have gone, but we're going to keep trying, we're going to keep looking for them. Hooded vultures, tawny eagles, and sometimes bataliers actually fly behind wild dogs. They know that wild dogs have got such a high success rate in terms of the kills that they make that they are in for a very good chance of being able to flutter down and pick up whatever the wild dogs leave behind. It's an interesting tactic, it's an interesting technique. They won't do that really to many of the other predators. Okay, there's another terrified looking, or no, not terrified looking, there's one very focused looking impala. Let's just go see. And often wild dogs, when they're running, because they've got those long legs that take enormous strides, a lot of the time they don't even, they barely touch the road. You'll get one track that's just bounced through and moved off. Excuse me, impala. Have you seen some wild dogs by any chance? These guys don't look too stressed out. They're dashing across the road, but mainly just because the herding instinct is telling them to go that way. One of them started running, so they all did. What do you see? Just me. Nope. Okay. No wild dogs here. Nevin! We've, obviously you've been hearing us chatting away on the Game Drive channel. 
And Nevin wants to know, if we spot something like tracks or an animal, do we have to call it in on the Game Drive channel? Yes, essentially, um, yes we do. And we do that for a couple of reasons. One is it's, it's a, a professional courtesy and it's politeness. And we know, we've all been guides with guests before, we all know what the job entails and how sometimes it can be unbelievably stressful when you've got guests for two days that want to see everything that the reserve has to offer. You are under pressure, so it is... Sometimes, it's just, it's just polite, really, um, because sometimes Taxon will call us into a sighting, sometimes we'll call him into a sighting. We never ever hide sightings from each other or tracks. The reason we call tracks in is because often, if a person is in the area as well, they can help you look and relocate that animal. They become very, very useful in helping you track down that creature that you're looking for. So now, for example, with the wild dogs, I'm listening to my game drive comms, waiting to see whether anybody is in the area that have picked up tracks. Come on, wild dogs. And a guide might perhaps not be looking for that particular set of tracks, but if you tell them that, that hey, there's leopard tracks going towards that road, then they can actually save you a huge amount of time because then they can say, okay, you can stop looking in that area because the tracks are now here. Come to this side and continue your search that way. So yes, we will always, always call in whatever we can find, whatever we have found. Sometimes we'll wait a little bit in terms of tracks and the reason that we do that is we're just trying to figure out exactly where those tracks have gone before we send somebody on a wild goose chase. But if we delay, it's just simply because we're making sure we've established what's going on. And the same goes for if we have a sighting. We'll find something, we'll establish the sighting, we'll get in, we'll, de we'll gauge the animal's mood. And the first thing you do when you see an animal, like a leopard or a lion or an elephant, before you pick up your game drive channel and you call it in, is you go and you look and you see how that animal is fe feeling. Are they on edge today? Would they be better off not having other vehicles with them? Do they have cubs with them? Because that determines how many vehicles will be allowed to come into the sighting. And so on and so forth. So if there is a delay, that's just why. The other reason we sometimes delay is because we don't know where we are. If we're off-road, we're trying to figure out exactly how to direct somebody into the sighting. Happened to me once or twice, I have to be honest. You start going, I took the third road west. <laughs> Dispatch, speaking, <laughs> speaking of um, Speaking of our radio communication, we had an interesting chat yesterday about calling lions fuzzies on the Game Drive channel and of course through, with much confusion on my part before it was pointed out to me that it was in fact the word mafuzzy, which means female. So welcome dispatch, I'm glad you're enjoying the ride. No, no fuzzies today. No fuzzies, just tracks of fuzzies and there's lots of different fuzzies around. And on that note, let's go and find out how James's search for the fuzzies is going. Sorry everybody, I'm just trying to figure out what's going on here. Sounds like lions, but I don't think they're with us. I think they're on Biffle's hook. Please go again with that position. Tax, tax, come in. I'm just going to find out from Taxon where those lions were seen. Go ahead, Tax. What, what was the position of that sighting? Okay, copy. Yeah, it's the Sticks Pride, everybody. Uh, you may have heard that. It sounds like they've killed a buffalo, but at Nkoro, which we do not drive to. I'm going to do a quick look in this spot here where I thought I saw the white belly of a lion earlier. The tracks do head in this direction. I've been constantly amazed by the lack of buffalo here recently. <laughs> I 
Gary, um, you say how far is Lion Rock from the Sabi Sands and do they still rescue lions? Gary, I have to confess to not having the faintest clue about what you're talking. I'm afraid I don't know about Lion Rock, um, so I'll get someone in the final control to try and have a look-see, but I'm not sure where Lion Rock is or what they do. Now, there are no tracks here. Apparently it's a big cat sanctuary near Bethlehem. Uh, no, we certainly are nowhere near there and I've got no idea how it operates. Bethlehem is a long way from where we are. Obviously not the same Bethlehem in Na Nazareth. This is a Bethlehem in uh, the Free State. No, I don't think I did see the white belly of a lion here, everyone. Clearly it was just a reflection or a mirage brought on by the desperate desire to see a lion. Oh well, who you know, I'm sure we'll see some, some stage. Exe, don't worry. What we can do though is just stop and have a little bit of a listen. Remains very silent. There's one or two chin spot battises going. A couple of Franklins still, and way in the distance, a bearded woodpecker. On we go. <laughs> Hello, Tony Blah. Um, <laughs> we were looking for ostriches yesterday, and you said, Did we have any luck finding them? Tony, I'm afraid we didn't find any ostriches, so I didn't get a chance to try the Australian emu attraction technique, which I'm not going to do here because it would be wasted. There are no ostriches, but when we next see an ostrich, I'll absolutely do it. No, there are no lions in this immediate vicinity. Ooh, it's quite interesting. Look, 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 they're mating. Those two blacksmith lapwings. Let's just watch them. Look, look at that, preparing for summer. You see, that's quite a bright shot. Ah, oh, there we go. That is the blacksmith lapwing, and as we head towards September, like I said, the birdies are going to become increasingly amorous with each other. I've never seen that before, everyone. That's a first time. There are three of them, you know. There's another one flying around above. Perhaps a jealous and scorned lover that must now go and find someone else. And also there, uh, the little bird there, Eggsy, is a three-banded plover. There we are. You might also vaguely be able to hear in the background the greater blue-eared glossy starling. Oh, we, I can actually see it, but we don't have the zoom lens or the super zoom, so we're not going to try and show it to you with the small lens. And that little plover will be looking for snails and other little invertebrates that live in the water. And unlike the hippos, of course, these aquatic birds can fly off when the water eventually does dry out. but still they too will feel the pressure, especially as the migrants start to return, hopefully expecting this new summer life. Uh, but until the rains come, that's not going to happen. Right, wonderful, let's move on. I 
Ah, good point. Virginia, you're in Kentucky and you say you don't recall seeing falcons on drive before. We don't see them very often. Uh, Brent had a European hobby, if I'm not mistaken, sometime, it was probably very early this year, I think, he had a European hobby. That's one of the falcon species that we get. Uh, I think it, I'm not sure if it, did he get it on camera? I think they did get it on camera, you know, but it came whizzing past quickly and then I think they got a bit of a look of it and then it was gone again. But the other two potential falcons that you can see out here are the, um, the Lanner falcon and the peregrine falcon, neither of which are common. I've seen Lanner around here before, I've never seen a peregrine falcon around here. You know, they're just not, I guess there's too much competition from other predatory birds, you know. I did see a lana on my last leave, though, in the hills of KwaZulu Natal. Now we're going to look at the road here and just see if we can't tell where on earth those tracks went. We might be lucky, but it's rather confusing. Aubrey and Ephraim from Cheetah Plains are looking around here as well. Who knows? Who knows? Then I think what we'll probably do is head down towards the south and see if that uh, wonderful queen of Juma hasn't crossed back onto here. We might be lucky there too. I can't believe that. I think those wild dogs probably popped across here, leapt to Sydney's dam and then went straight into the Manileti. That t tends to be what they do. So, but sad that we didn't manage to see them. Eggsy, do you don't see any form of animal life, do you, that we can show people? Impala, perhaps, bird, snail would do at this stage. See any snails? <laughs> it's getting a little desperate. <laughs> ah, now Jamie yesterday had the most crazy sighting that we don't normally get here. And James Richard, you want me to play you the call of the bird that she saw yesterday, the trumpeter hornbill. Now that's very unusual for these parts. You hear those lion tracks again? Let me stop and just see if there isn't a bird alarm calling or something while I play you the call of the trumpeter hornbill. The call of the trumpeter hornbill, of course, um, can be likened to that of a baby crying. It's quite disturbing if you don't know what it is. Uh, huh, for hornbill. Come now. Yes, 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 yes. There we go. Right. Here he is, everybody. James Richard, are you ready? Don't be distressed, this is not a child calling, it is the bird. It's the most mournful, dreadful sound, isn't it? But it's unmistakable. Eggsy, would you, if you heard that, you'd be very nervous, wouldn't you? You'd think that someone was dying. I think I had a girlfriend who used to cry like that sometimes. It was very disconcerting. Um, <laughs> never mind. Let's go to Jamie before I say something ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> I'm having a good chuckle just hearing some of the things that James has been espousing on this morning. I don't know where these wild dogs have gone. I can't find a track. I've found lots and lots of very relaxed looking impala. They appear to have vanished into thin air. I think for now, uh, there's a good chance that they've gone into Buffalo's Hook. 
I think for now what we're going to do is we're going to continue on with our search for shadow and maybe even try and look for Karula. But as you know, our live safaris, nothing goes as planned. I have absolutely no idea where anything is at this point. The wild dogs have pulled a runner, as they generally do. And shadow has disappeared into a block. Basically what a block means, by the way, is a patch of bush between, or a patch of vegetation that is between the roads. She's disappeared into a block that she loves. And that's where I found the tracks, by the way. They've been trodden on by an elephant, which is why it took me a while to find them. But um, it's taken, once upon a time, we had four guides in that particular patch of vegetation, all looking for shadow for four hours without any success. So we've got to hope that perhaps she's sitting on a termite mound or something similar, giving us a chance to spot her. I mean, Tingana was very kind to us yesterday when he stood up on the branch of the tree that he was sitting in and made his outline very clear. Perhaps Shadow will be kind enough to do the same. And we might bump into the wild dogs. I, d I don't know what direction they've gone in. And one of the things that I've been trying to do is stop and listen every now and again because I, I mentioned earlier that they twitter around a carcass and they beg each other. And But Ginny has asked whether or not wild dogs will howl like wolves. And of course they are true, they are related to wolves, true canid species. They don't howl, but they've got a beautiful mournful, oh dear, we're still talking about mournful calls. They have got a beautiful mournful sound that goes something like this. Whoop, whoop, whoop. So it's not quite a howl and it's the opposite instead of lifting their heads up to the sky they actually stand and bounce the sound off the ground when they make that call and it's a contact call between the different groups and what's actually i mean now both both james and i are moving into something very sad but the wild dog pack this lower sabi pack they're the three remaining members the rest of them were wiped out by canine distemper including the pregnant alpha female with 18 pups utterly tragic, a serious blow for an animal species that is tremendously threatened and under pressure in terms of their population numbers. But this poor pack calls constantly. The remaining three members, James had them calling and I've spoken to some of the other guides and they've also said that they've heard lots and lots. Every time they see them they're calling. Let's go see what those Impala are doing. They're not running away from wild dogs but they do look like they are having a bit of a sparring session. Oh sorry Viam, I hope you're holding on. Lots of dust flying around. Yep, they are having a wonderful time with each other, chasing each other around. Oh, chaos. Much grunting. Wonderful sound that Impala make that are is so incongruous. Okay, so this morning is this morning of the is the morning of Impala sightings. Let's see if they carry on, although generally this sort of behaviour at this time of year doesn't last all that long. It's quite fun to see when they do do it. Chasing each other around, looking big and scary with their tails up and the males behaving in a very silly manner. Are you done now? He's not. He's not. <laughs> He's going to... Oh, oh, no. We've all calmed down again. Now, during the rutting period, the males are incredibly distracted which is a boon for the predators of the area, which is why during the rutting period we noticed that both Karula and Shadow were very successful in terms of catching male impala. And Kimberly was wondering about, for the poor impala, how much they need to sleep, since as you can imagine when you're on everybody's menu, nap time is done with a little bit of um, reticence. Now the answer is they don't need to sleep very much at all. They might doze for a couple of minutes at a time, 
usually separate. That's why having a herd is such a big advantage because you can close your eyes and know that there's lots of eyes and ears still looking out for you. So they don't go to sleep at night. They'll go and they'll lie down and they might doze off every few minutes. But that's where ruminating comes in because the process of ruminating, you know when they either lie down or just standing, bringing up the boluses of grass from in their second or in their first stomach, in the rumen, they bring up the, the ball of cud and they start to chew it and then they swallow it and they start, it's one of the ways that their digestive system is very very effective and what studies have shown is that the brain waves of ruminating animals mimic those of us in deep sleep. So whilst they do not need to sleep for long periods of time, they kind of get that brain rest that the body needs in order to repair and to jump start all of its processes. Are you done now boys? A whole herd of bachelors. A gentleman's club of Impala. Right, and now we're all done. We're all relaxed again. Back to breakfast. A little bit of sparring, a little bit of exercise. I was kind of hoping if we sat here the wild dog might come sprinting through. I'm actually going to put my radio on to scan. <laughs> Blobbit McBlob has said that he would not like to be an Impala because he's far too fond of sleep. Fair enough, I agree with you. Sleep is a wonderful thing. I wonder, I know that, I, I often think that cats enjoy their rest time. And of course, lions and leopards are champion sleepers when they want to be. But I wonder if they get the same enjoying, enjoyment out of nap time in the same way human beings do. Or are human beings the only creatures that nap just sort of for fun and enjoy it? Obviously we nap when we're tired. But we of course have changed our whole sleep cycle. As human beings, instinctively, our sleep patterns should be broken up into two separate sleeps. If that makes any sense. You had the first portion of the night and then people would wake up, um, go do their prayers or do whatever else it was and then go back to sleep again. And they would wake, they'd have a patch in the middle of the night where they'd wake up. And that, I mean, has changed for us relatively recently in terms of our species evolution. Because if, as far back as the sort of 16th, 17th century, you've got records of people waking up in the middle of the night, going about their business for a couple of hours in the dark, and then going back to sleep again. Now, human beings are actually meant to, instead of having that solid sleep that we get now, we're actually meant to have several different, we're meant to have two separate sleep cycles per night. It's very, very interesting that. I find that the way that we sleep fascinating. I completely agree with you Marianne. I love that sound. Marianne is watching from Texas and says it is incongruous the way that they can look so beautiful and delicate and yet create these deep gruff bellows that Marianne says sounds a little bit like a leopard sawing and absolutely it's so true. I remember as a child hearing that for the first time, walking in the bush and getting such a fright. I was convinced I was about to be eaten by some predator when I first heard that. I had no idea what was going on because of course my trips to the bush as a child were usually dictated by school holidays. So that you often wasn't in the time of the mating season of the Impala. So the first time I heard it, I was very, very confused. It is incredible. It's also sometimes a little bit silly. Here is an elephant there, but it is playing very, very hard to get. A large grey shape hidden behind the trees. And Dispatch, just while we look at our Ellie, since it's not right out in the open, Dispatch, just to answer your question, what exactly do Impala and Kudu sound like? The Kudu have a deep booming bark. 
The Impala I can't begin to imitate because it's impossible. I'm useless at it. Now, unfortunately, I'm somewhat technologically challenged. I have textbooks and no calls for you to show you on my iPad, but perhaps James might be. I'm not sure if he's got the mammal calls on his cellular device, but perhaps he might be able to provide that. We'll see. We'll ask him and see whether or not he can provide. Otherwise, I know that definitely if you keep watching this afternoon when Brent is on the Sunset Safari, he will be able to oblige, I'm sure. But it's much more fun to try and imitate. I can't do the Impala though. I really can't. I'm useless. It does sort of sound like a leopard sawing, but they, they, I don't know, can't do it. I've tried. I've embarrassed myself many, many times attempting to imitate rutting Impala. You are all more than welcome to try it at home if you can do a better job than I can, which you may well be able to do. I can hear more elephants. They've also, the fact is, they tell us something important here as well. And that is the fact that the wild dogs didn't come this way. Or at least not with the elephants realizing it. And the reason I say that is because elephants absolutely cannot stand the sight of wild dogs. It's totally bizarre because there must be some throwback instinct that reminds them of a time where their ancestors like pygmy elephants were small enough for a canid to be a threat to them. Because the wild dogs as they stand now, there's no way they'd ever catch an elephant. Absolutely not. And yet elephants, whenever they see them, band together, they become furious and they chase them with much screaming and we would have heard that if the wild dogs had come through in this direction. I'm trying to find you a nice clear view of an elephant. And I think that for some of you, unless I've got my time zones wrong, it's also still World Elephant Day. Unless I'm very much confused, in which case, happy World Elephant Day. I'm glad that we could provide you with a view of one, albeit very hidden. Okay, where to go now? These wild dogs definitely haven't popped out here. And I know what we'll do. We're going to go and check the Gauri repeater. Shadow likes to pop out there. And welcome to Golden. It's lovely to have you on board. First time I've answered a question from you. Golden wants to know what would be a really exciting find or a rare find or a special find on these live safaris. I can tell you what would be unusual. Something like a pangolin. A pangolin is a scaly anteater. It looks like a walking shuffling artichoke actually if I'm completely honest an amazingly rare mammal but there's so many wonderful things to see that I don't know that I could begin to tell you what would be what would be truly special certain bird species that we don't necessarily see all the time we always get very excited about the nocturnal creatures we saw Brent and myself saw two civets last night both of which were amazing sightings and we hardly ever get to see them on the live safaris. A porcupine, a brown hyena. We know that the one brown hyena was seen once on these live safaris. The cousin of the spotted hyena has not been seen since. An aardwolf. We know that aardwolf is also a member of the hyena family, but much, much smaller. And that is not a scavenger, but rather an insect eater, an insectivore. Imagine seeing an aardwolf. Or one of our rare antelope species, a sable perhaps, something similar. There's too many special things to even begin to list. An art park for me, because I still haven't seen one in the wild, which is now bordering upon the ridiculous, considering how long, how much time I have spent out here in the bush. I don't know why, I have some kind of art park curse on me. What else would be serval, caracal, a medium-sized cat. We have yet to see a caracal, but we have seen a few servals, which look like a miniature cheetah. But all of our animals are special. Impala can be utterly fascinating. We might see them all the time. Zebra can be totally fascinating. Even if just to give us 
a lovely demonstration of the way that their stripes work when they're hiding behind trees. <coughs> oh, finally! Sorry, excuse me. That sneeze has been building for a very long time. Finally. Now, zebra always have very barrel-like bellies. But this particular zebra has a very barrel-like belly. In fact, so barrel-like that I would not be at all surprised if this was a pregnant zebra. Look how it's hanging down there. She looks like she's about to pop. We have once, talking about special things for Golden, with James and with Dave on camera, they once got to witness a zebra birth live. And moments like that are incredibly special. We got to see a wildebeest. We've seen a couple of wildebeest births. In fact, Viem, who is on camera with me this morning, has filmed a live wildebeest birth before. And in fact, that is how he got his nickname, the wildebeest. Which we sometime ref sometimes refer to him as. Next on the list, I think, would be a live elephant birth. Imagine watching a live elephant birth. I'm not sure there'd be any words to describe the magic of a sighting like that. But even peaceful moments like this are very, very special. Spent in the company of some really stunning animals. Accompanied by their host of ox pickers fluttering about them. Picking off the ticks and doing a marvellous job at that. I'm not imagining things, am I? I mean, this zebra really does look enormous. Go forward a little bit. Just want to double check that it is in fact a female or else I'm going to be terribly embarrassed. Because if it is not a female, then it is most definitely not pregnant. And so far, I haven't seen any conclusive evidence, apart from the barrel belly. What have you seen, Zebra? Why have you gone so still? Okay, relaxed again. They heard something. Something made them unsettled. And animals can be relied upon to have far more sensitive senses than our hearing or our smell. The female's relaxed again. And it pays to pay attention to every little rustle in the bushes, because you never know when a lion might be trying to sneak up on them. And there is a lovely question coming through from Matt. Phew, it is a female. Thank goodness I would have been most embarrassed if that had not been a female and just a very, very large, round-bellied male. The reason it's so difficult, just quickly, is the fact that the, the bellies of the zebra, their digestive system, produces an enormous amount of gas as a byproduct of the whole process, the bacteria within them, which means that their, their stomachs always look swollen, which is why it's not always as easy as one thinks it might be. Unfortunately, our zebra are disappearing, but I'll answer Matt's question. Which is, can zebra de be domesticated? And that's a question that you get as a safari guide very, very frequently. And the answer is absolutely not. Domesticate or tame zebras, zebra that have been habituated to people, are horrible things. And I just speak from slightly traumatized, because I've been bitten by one before, and it's sore. They are not built to carry weight upon their backs. They cannot be ridden without doing serious damage to them. And of course you get those lovely uh, children's movies where the zebra are being ridden by people. I think there was one called Stripes actually. You cannot ride a zebra without doing it serious damage. And if you manage to get on a, a zebra's back, well bravo to you. Because of course our dogs, cats and horses have been bred and domesticated for centuries. The wild animals out here, one generation of being accustomed to people or tamed by people is absolutely not enough to rid them of their wild, natural wild instincts. 
I think I've spotted a leopard log. I have, I have spotted a leopard log. It looked a lot more like a leopard. Ah, oh, that's not a leopard at all. That doesn't look anything like a leopard, Jamie. How disappointing. It sort of looks like it could be the head of a leopard, maybe. How terribly devastating. Happens to me very often. Oh, it really, from this angle, <laughs> it really does look like a leopard. Can you see the way I'm looking at it, Viam? In the sun. See, it's sort of... Okay, maybe it doesn't when you zoom in like that. But it does when you're looking through human eyes without the power of binocular vision. Oh, well. So, domesticating animals, even, even cheetah, which are one of the easiest, apparently one of the easiest animals to habituate to people. I don't, I, I don't agree with it. Animals are meant to be wild, not tamed. And it's something that I feel like, I feel very strongly about. I do not believe that people need to have exotic or wild pets. And sorry, Matt, I'm not having a go at you. I know that's not what you were asking at all. But it's just, a, it's a point that I've seen a few pictures of people popping up every now and again with all of their, their exotic pets. And it makes my skin crawl because it's about, it's about that person. They want those pets because it's an ego thing. Uh, sure, they might love them. I'm sure they love them. But is it necessary? We've got dogs and cats and horses. We don't really need to be domesticating wild animals as well. And sometimes I think how much I would love to go and interact with elephants on a, a constant level. But at the same time, that's just me. That's because I want to interact with them. And there are in fact wild animals deserving of a great deal more respect than that. Speaking of wild animals, I'm going to try and locate this wild leopard that's been leading us upon a merry dance all morning and wait perhaps for the wild dogs to pop out as well. I know that James has been on the search for wild lions. Let us go and find out how it's going in the Mulwati. Everybody, this, so the entire morning spent looking for wild lions, as Jamie said, has resulted in us finding a dead tortoise. You see that, Zunda? Exi, the universe hath smiled upon us. It has given us a dead tortoise uh, that we didn't spot, actually. Connor managed to spot it. I think he was looking for something to eat at the time. He's so far eaten an apple, a banana, what else? Some biltong, Some biltong which is uh, beef jerky, for those of you who don't know. I've no doubt he's got a number of other snacks as well. Now, I'm going to get up onto some solid ground here and tell you what we did find although it must get a little boring hearing this sort of thing we found more lion tracks no lions two lionesses this time going from the road that we were on sort of this way into the block I did walk briefly on into the block on the tracks um, and then I lost them which is not surprising and I think they're heading well they're definitely heading towards this road so we might be lucky we haven't driven this road yet let's just have a quick look at this rather splendid fellow He's, um, well, what was a rather splendid fellow, a, a speaks hinged tortoise, and there is the hinge. You can see he's able to close the back up uh, when he's not in an advanced state of rigor mortis, uh, but that's just a kind of sort of loose bit of cartilaginous, uh, what would we call it, cartilaginous piece of the carapace, so it can close up a bit. But if you look inside there, you can see the bones. And often people think of the shell of a tortoise as being something sort of like the shell of a snail, which is so totally separate to the actual animal. Well, that is not the case here. But this forms an integral part of actually the, um, the skeleton. And the skeleton attaches to the underside of the tortoise's shell. And that's why often, once they've been eaten like this, you can still see the bones inside. Anyway, I don't know what happened to him. We found the other day five or six of them in this same sort of state, the flesh eaten out from inside them, but no obvious damage to the carapace or the plastron, so the shell is almost totally undamaged. I don't know what's eating them. I really don't. Quite interesting. All right. 
Exie, we're going to return this to the wild. We'll be picked up by the next wild earth guide to drive past here and go, oh, there's a dead tortoise over there. Let's have a look. Justin, you want to know, you want to know if there's any worse bird call in the world than that creepy hornbill? It depends on your definition of worse. As I've said, the the uh, corvids or the the crows have got a particularly unattractive call. I don't like that very much. The lilac-breasted roller has got a dreadful call. Now there are more tracks of lions crossing into Torchwood. I don't think they're here anymore, everyone. Anyway, doesn't matter. We'll keep we'll keep looking. Um, I, I, it is creepy. I wouldn't describe it as my worst call, the trumpet of hornbill's call. Um, I think very much my worst call would have to be something like a crow's call. Or, um, yeah, it would be the crow's call. That kind of wah, 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 which keeps you in mind of death and grey, dreary days. Because the trumpet to hornbill is kind of a trumpet to hornbill is a bit like a peacock's call, which is a um, sort of uh, it's got a slightly eerie but tropical feel about it. I feel, which I think is a bit nicer. <laughs> and dispatch Griffin, you want to know what the Nyala and the uh, impala sound like well there is there are two near impala they go like this i don't have a recording but i'll make it i'll try and do an attempt of a nyala alarm bark they go you can see how terrified that alarm that impala is now so that's the impala, and then the kudu, and the nyala, and the bushbuck, which live in thicker bush, have got a much lower frequency alarm bark, and it goes, <laughs> But it's much deeper than that, and that means that it can travel through the thick bush. It's a, the sort of lower the frequency, the more readily it will travel through the trees. So dispatch griffin. Wonderful name that. Uh, I hope that answers your question. And Jamie apparently was also hoping I would do an impression of the impala rutting noises. Um, what do they do? They go, it's a bit like the alarm call. It goes, <laughs> Yes, it's exactly the same. Exe, what a lovely picture you had there of the tree at the end. Well done. <laughs> All righty, let's see what we can find around the corner here. It would seem to me that the lions have crossed out of this area. Hello, Pierre. Nice to hear from you. I hope you are sitting with a croissant and perhaps a delicious cafe somewhere in the world. You're probably an American, and so you don't talk like that at all. So if you are, I'm sorry about that. Uh, Pierre, um, do tell us where you're from, like I say. You say, what percentage of South Africa is under national parks or conserved land? I think officially state-owned land said somewhere around eight or nine percent state-owned conservation land 
I, I know the recommendation is sort of 11 percent. I'm not sure which great ecologist thumb suck that figure, but um, I think we're sitting at around 9 percent here. Then there's probably quite a lot more under private control, so you're probably looking at about 12 percent of South Africa, I would say. Not as big as uh, you might expect in a country like this, which, uh, you know, has got a, well, quite a reputation for its conservation practices. But we do also have 52 million souls living in South Africa, and, and they are... That number is becoming distressingly larger by the day. Ooh, um, Kerry, you're in Boston and you want to know if I recommend anywhere specific in Kruger. Uh, Kerry, like most things in life, this very much depends on how much moolah you have to spend on your holiday. Um, if you are lucky enough to be paying in dollars, which you will be, at round about thirteen and a half dollars to one rand, um, well, your options are fairly wide. You can public, you can go sort of stay in a public camp in the Kruger for almost nothing if you're paying in dollars, or you can go to a private reserve like the one we're on. Um, a Jumas will probably not suit you because you have to take out the whole camp. If you can. If, I mean, if you're coming in a group, then Juma's brilliant because it's probably the best value bed in, in uh, the Sabi Sands. But otherwise, you could stay at Cheetah Plains or Arethusa. They're kind of um, they're very nice camps and middle cost, if you like, but not, they ain't cheap. Uh, or you could, uh, if you're feeling particularly flash, you could stay at Singita or Londolozi down in the south of the Sabi Sands. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I mean, there are lots of different options that just really do depend on your budget. The private reserves, the Sabi Sands, um, obviously nice because you can, especially if you have a short time, you've got a guide, they can drive off-road, which you're unable to do, of course, if you are um, in the Kruger Park, where you self-drive, but somebody uh, I know the other day drove through the Kruger Park and saw, um, I think they saw leopard twice in the space of sort of 20 minutes. So you can see some amazing stuff. You can see those are impala over there and because we haven't found anything else we're going to look at them again. Go ahead pajamas. Jamie's calling on the radio. Jamie, Jamie, go ahead. James, I'm not sure if you copied my update, but I've got what looks like fresh in Kutso, form of fuzzy, and uh, nothing running about that, on Rebecca's Road. I think they've come north it's towards interesting. that open area around those where you so have... Jamie's got lion tracks on Rebecca's Road. Okay, copy, Jamie. Yeah, I think the ones we're following have crossed into Tortured. We'll come sort of slowly around that way. We'll go slowly around that way, everybody, but we're not going to go to great speed there because I'd also like to check the southern boundary just to see if shadows tracks don't pop out there. Not shadows, Karulas. Right, Eggsy, you've done some very good Impala filming today. I will attempt to find you something more, uh, well, what shall we say, higher profile shortly. On we go. <laughs> Justin, you say other than my black-backed jackal call, which animal do I enjoy um, impersonating the most? Oh, ja it's just such a wide variety that I enjoy uh, impersonating Justin. Um, I probably enjoy impersonating some of the rangers on the radio uh, more than I enjoy doing the animals. Uh, because some of their voices are quite spectacular. Um, I've no doubt the same is done to me. The blackback jackal, for those of you who wonder, go like this. Oh, there's a squirrel's nest here. I won't make the jackal call just yet, for it will frighten the squirrel, everyone. But it's in this tree, and the sun is going to be at an appalling angle. Hang on. Eggsy, can you see the, 
that broken off branch, the first one going out to the left on the trunk of the tree there. Down, down, there. That's, there's a hole there and obviously the squirrels are living in there. I just saw a squirrel run in there. There, there watch, coming up at the top, at the top. There we go, well spotted. And now going into the nest, perhaps. Ah, oh, thank you, Mr. Squirrel, for sitting for us. Very nice. The top sighting of the day so far, Zander. Oh, look! Did you see that? It stuck its head out of the stuck its head out of the nest. Just keep watching there. Just blinking in the morning sun, that's really sweet. Trying to stay warm. We had a lovely question yesterday about why it is that elephants do not have any fur on their bodies. And I went into the explanation of the um, surface area to body ratio. If you're a squirrel, your surface area to body, ra to body mass ratio is much higher. Is that correct? Yes, it is. That means that you've got more surface area per kilogram of mass than you do uh, if you're an elephant. And that means that you lose heat very quickly. And so squirrels will sit in the sun very early morning, fluff their fur out, and uh, sort of ball up in the same way that I guess your house cat does if it's cold. Those elephants are not known for balling up in the sun. Had enough of the squirrel, Eggsy? You can't see it. Okay. <laughs> I think the <laughs> lens is giving a little bit of trouble. I will now give the jackal call before we go across to Jamie. <clears throat> Zander, just this will be a very frightening experience for you, so I will just be aware. Okay. Right here we go. Over to Jamie. That was seriously impressive. That was uh, Jerry very kindly held the microphone of the radio to the screen so that I could hear James calling like a jackal. And I must say, spot on. Very, very impressed. Right, so to add to everybody's confusion this morning, because the animals seem to be playing games with us. I've just found fresh lion tracks close to where those male tracks were that walked over Shadow's tracks that distracted us from Shadow in the first place, etc, etc. And I'm trying to work out where they've gone. There's fresh female and cubs. Cubs on top of the female's tracks, so running behind as the Inkuhuma, or as all lion cubs do. And they've come in the I think they've come in the direction, I should probably clarify, of the set of river systems that, or creek systems, that run along close to quarantine clearings. And they've been spending a huge amount of time in here. This is where James had them on foot not too long ago when a female lion burst out of the bushes next to him chasing a warthog. Exciting things happen on bushwalk. Um, and I don't, I, I don't know where they've gone from there. They must be hidden in this river system somewhere here. I'm just looping the area, making sure that they didn't pop out. This is where Steph and I started tracking them yesterday. So it feels as though the Inkuhumas have been walking circles and circles and backwards and forwards. Definitely keeping us guessing and being very, very unpredictable in terms of their movements. The night before last night, they walked all the way with the cubs to Arethusa and Simbambili and then walked all the way back to where they started from which is also truly puzzling I know that they're hunting and therefore they're pushing constantly for food but it's, it did seem very odd that they chose to do that big loop as they did back to exactly the same spot I'm guessing it's because that younger set of cubs is still around there and they just haven't quite got to the age where they can keep up with the rest of the pride but the females have to keep returning back to that den site at Gari Cutline I 
and I'm sorry Tony I'm very oh actually I must tell you an amazing story about this about hyenas before but first to answer Tony's question no updates on our hyenas I keep I promise you each and every single day whenever I'm on a road close to a hyena den I go and I check it or I check for tracks just to see whether or not they haven't snuck back onto Juma at some point but it seems as though they are still on Manuleti and I think they are going to stay there until the lions and the lionesses with their cubs in particular stop spending as much time as they have in the sort of core region of the hyenas den sites and territories because I think in a lot that's played a large large part in the reason behind our disappearance of hyenas what I was going to tell you was that Brent and myself went to some friends last night for dinner and we had a braai which is a barbecue only better as a South African and um, with some Venezuelan friends of ours so an amazing meat filled evening in terms of the the dinner that we had however of course the, the scent of the barbecue drifted across and attracted a friend to the party and this hyena sort of circled us the whole time around the outside of their fence and then we all went inside to say our farewells and they'd shut the glass sliding door that closes off their lounge and the next thing we look up I promise you the hyena had its nose against the glass you could there was steam coming out from the grass from the glass where its nose was pressed up against it and it was breathing on the window it was all misted up it was incredible also very very cheeky and a good lesson in why it's so so important to keep one's doors closed at night because a hyena is a brave thing and they're very smart and they know that human beings mean food and they will come into a house if they think they can get something out of it and that is exceptionally dangerous for two reasons one they might find you fast asleep which you definitely don't want I told you today is the day of the impala and two you might come out and find that you've trapped them in your kitchen or something similar and a trapped animal hyena are no threat to human beings if you are sensible nope also perfectly relaxed so the lions might have walked through here they're all knocking off sort of but no more so than your usual impala behavior But yes, also you might end up trapping an animal. Now hyenas, during the day we are not on their menu and even at night they are not a threat to us unless you sleep out in the open without adequate protection. And the important part of that story is that their garden is fenced off. So just, when, if you ever find yourself in, in Africa or visiting an area like this, just be aware that fences don't mean anything really. There's, there's no animal really that a, a fence will actually keep out if it wants to come in. But that was funny, it was very funny, this hyena's face pressed up against the glass as if to say I can't believe I didn't get an invitation to this dinner. Are there any leftovers? Which of course there weren't. Not that we would have given him any leftovers anyway. Oh no, I'm so confused. I mean not oh no. This is wonderful, but we've got some fresh female leopard tracks, which is great news. It's probably Karula from when she went to have a drink at the dam. But I'm now so confused I don't know where to start. I say fresh, fresh-ish from last night. Jump out and show you what we're looking at. We started with the male lion tracks. Now you get an idea to compare female leopard tracks to those. So Karula, we got an update from our viewers that they'd heard leopard calling around, I think it was about three o'clock last night. Where's a good, right by, my feet. right by my feet, is this a good example? Yes, this is probably the best example. So this is our female leopard track. Essentially the same structure as that male lion with the back pads with the three lobes. This is, requires slightly more delicate work. So the three lobes are here, which tells us it's a cat, and then the four toes. Hyenas and dogs only have two lobes at the back. She's going this way. She walked up along past quarantine. Is it Karula? Is it Shadow? It's probably not Shadow, just because of the area. Did we see Karula last night? It was dark. I don't think we did. The tracks came in from Arethusa. 
much confusion. And now the go away bird, I think, is calling at me. Yes, it's calling at me. Whee! Okay. Well, let's try and follow these then. It's a nice place to start. And the other animals have been giving us the run around. Let's see where these go. I'm attached to my door handle. And what these tracks tell me almost immediately is that at some point last night, while we were fast asleep, Karula walked right past our house, judging from the distance. And surprise, surprise, there's also lion tracks, just in case things were not confusing enough. <laughs> oh goodness, is this lion, sorry, I'll get back to this in a moment. Is, is this lion on top of the tracks? No, Karuna's tracks are on top of the lion tracks. Right, sorry, on the subject of sort of human being and animal interaction, Michael would like to know what I think of the cheetah and the Maasai Mara that have learned to use the vehicles essentially like termite mounds and they jump on the bonnet and they sit there and they observe whatever's happening. I think it's risky. Uh, I, have a, I have a very strict policy that is I don't let animals touch my vehicle. Whether they be hyena cubs or whatever it is, I don't let them get to that point where that, that line is crossed. But the cheetah, cheetah are relatively innocuous. They're not really a threat to human beings. Though there's one or two very isolated cases of cheetah attacking people. But it's very rare. But you know, it just takes one thing to go wrong. The cheetah gets startled by one of the guests. Or something happens. It makes me nervous. Let's put it this way. But I mean, what, what are you meant to do? Especially in those open areas. I mean, you have to give the cheetah credit for learning to utilize and to use people that way. I've had lions try and hide behind my car before, so they know. Hmm? More, lion crossing More lion crossing that way. I'm so thrilled. They really are keeping me very confused. There's lions going south, there's lions going east. And Karula. Oh, I'm so confused. The cats today are not picking one direction, not the Karuda ever does, but the lions are keep now really keeping us guessing. Why have they come this way? Brent describes it as the Sunday morning crossword puzzle, while the cats on Saturday have apparently decided that we needed extra difficult this morning. Yep, two of them, it's like a male, maybe we've got a mating pair somewhere. Ah, the mysteries of the bush, it's half the fun, is trying to figure out exactly what's going on. Now the, oh no, now the cubs have joined them. Oh no, that's my imagination, there's no cubs. While I attempt to puzzle out what on earth is going on here and try to separate which tracks are which, let's go across to James for an update. Oh my god. Ah. Ah. Now this is not a good tree for a monkey to be in. because they can't go anywhere from it except down the trunk, which means that they will have to jump if they want to escape something that comes to get them.
I haven't taken one picture today. That's not good, Connor. James Henry Media Works doesn't take one picture. Maybe I'll get a nice monkey shot. Monkey, monkey, monkey business. We live? Yeah. Oh, goodness gracious. Um, how did we know that? I didn't know we were live. Thank goodness I didn't say anything bad. Um, how long have we been live? There's a the monkeys, everybody. Oh, well that's good. Oh, I see. Okay, I was telling Connor that this wasn't a good tree for monkeys to be in. I have no idea why I didn't know we were live. I do apologise, everyone. Uh, it's not a good tree for monkeys to be live, to be in because you can see that they can't jump from this tree to another tree. Now, monkeys, if we drive towards them, they will probably be relatively relaxed, but if we were to approach this tree on foot, what you'd find is that they would panic. Um, they'd probably jump out of it, and if you tried to climb the tree, then they really would get a fright. It's quite interesting because a lot of people think that a monkey or a baboon feels completely safe in a tree. They don't. They realize that they're cornered. And they are not sure, as far as human beings go, how good we are at climbing trees. Because we look like we should be able to climb trees, uh, but obviously we're fairly incompetent when compared with something like a monkey. Now, let's see how close we can get. Oh, this is wonderful. I think we're going to get a really nice sighting of these things here. So it's a particularly good tree for viewing monkeys in because they don't, they're not often able to go anywhere. And they're sitting in here, obviously trying to get, eat the um, jackalberries. No idea how I missed that we were live. Eggsy knew. We're on the same radio system. And they're eating these, like I say, jackalberries. I'm waiting for them to ripen because they're not so nice now. The monkeys don't mind them too much. But we don't think they're particularly delicious. I fed you one, didn't I, Eggsy? I tried to feed you one, yes. <laughs> yeah. And they're also... Oh, there is a tiny little one above us. I don't know if you can even get that one. You see it there? It's right above us, everyone. I don't. I don't think that. I don't think that Eggsy is uh, going to be able to get to it. I will try and take a picture with my camera. <laughs> but because I'm no, never mind, Eggsy. Let's. Uh, let's Let's find an easier one. There's one there. Oh, there's a nice little one there. It's a really pretty tree, this. There's a nice one there that we're looking at. That's just, look at the light on that one, isn't it pretty? I'm trying to get a photograph of that one. Failing, dismally. There we go. No, he moved. Beautiful. Golden light in the jackalberry tree. And I don't know if you can hear in the background, you can hear the hoop hoop going. Hoop hoop hoop. Hoop hoop hoop. Hoop hoop hoop. Hoop hoop hoop. Hoop hoop. Yes, James Richard, I agree with you. You say you're excited for the day that you see jackals eating the fruit of a jackalberry tree. 
Yes, I think it will be an interesting day. I think I've seen it once before. And indeed it was interesting. Hmm. Stunning tree. Hello Harry, you're talking about the tree and you say it looks pretty wide. Do I have any idea how old it is? They're pretty slow growing. Um, I would put, I'm going to say it's probably about a hundred or so, but if you look at the trunk, and no one can give me an explanation for why the trunk is like this, it is uniquely twisted in a very even manner. Can you see that? Now the jackalberry tree is not known to have a fluted stem in the same way that a uh, torchwood tree has got a fluted stem, but look how perfectly and symmetrically it's twisted. And I'm fascinated by how that happened. It's growing on what is essentially a... I mean, it's a dam wall. It's, uh, it's, it is on the banks of this river, but a lot of the soil that it's growing in, uh, it was placed here when they had a dam, basically, were in the, underneath it there. And so I wonder if that hasn't um, sort of affected the way it's grown. Look, monkey, I want to get a picture of you. Gosh, you've got to be quick with monkeys. I've got to tell you to take a picture. Otherwise, it's a disaster. Justin, you say, imagine human beings still had tails and how different our daily lives would be. Justin, I, 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 <laughs> I imagine they would be slightly different, yes. Um, I'm not really sure in what way. I mean, I suppose our clothes would be different. We'd have to have special sh pants that allowed our tails to, you know, come out of our... our, our, our come out and comfortably sit. Uh, we might use them if they were particularly prehensile to, uh, while we read a book, we might be able to uh, tip coffee into our mouths using our tails. It might be quite useful. Uh, we might use them to open a door while on the phone. Uh, that, so that sort of thing. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> it's just, and I can't say I've spent a huge amount of time imagining what it would be like to have a tail. Have you, Eggsy? No. Nope. No. Ah, now apparently Jamie and VM have talked about this often and decided that they would love to have tails. I think that's quite odd myself, uh, but you know, we don't live in a camp of normality. Now I've just seen a fruit that's been dropped by one of these things, but I don't want to freak them out. Let's just, just watch carefully. They will come back. If they do panic completely because I get out of the car, um, they will come back here. Let's just watch their reaction as I move out the car. I don't think they'll come out of the tree because they've got used to us now. But they will definitely react to me. They will watch me quite carefully now. And they might start making the odd crackling alarm call going... Yeah, just, yeah, I don't know if you heard that. Just went kak kak. They're starting to ripen now, and that's what they look like when they're ripe. They don't, they're not very fleshy, but it is quite sweet. There you are, Connor. I eat it. Yes, you must eat it. It's a pip. It's a pip. Is it a delicious pip? It's quite sweet. Better. You've had better pips. Oh. They're obviously not very ripe then. All right, I think let's move on from here. See if we can't get something. They're very frustrating from trying to take pictures of these monkeys. I didn't get one. Okay. 
Oh, Viola, a nice question from you again. Please do tell us where you're from. It's always so nice to know. Um, you want to know, are these friendly monkeys? Well, I, mean, I don't think they're unfriendly, but Viola, I think probably quite a lot in line with what Jamie was talking about, about domesticating animals and keeping wild animals and that sort of thing. It's, it's a similar sort of uh, end, or it's a similar, it's on the spectrum of the same discussion. None of these animals are friendly around people if they come into contact with people. So monkeys are afraid of us around camps, where they get into camps, where uh, they steal food and where people feed them, they become extremely unfriendly and they will bite people, especially women. They're completely chauvinist. They leave men alone generally, but they bite women. I don't know why, um, but that is the case. And it's because people think and hope they're going to be friendly that they are fed. So if you go to a camp, any camp anywhere in South Africa, they will say, do not feed the monkeys, please. About 70% of tourists are unable to take this uh, instruction seriously and they think the monkeys are so cute and they take an orange and they give it to the monkey and the monkey takes it and looks like this and then it bites them. And so they remain friendly as long as they are not used to us. No wild animal out here is um, inherently particularly friendly to human beings. And it's only it's once they lose their fear of us that it becomes quite nervy. And Andrew, you're wondering if a monkey will make a good pet. Um, let us, for argument's sake, say you found a tiny baby orphaned monkey and you raised it. Uh, it would become used to you, absolutely. And then it would be, I think it would become very, very much um, an animal that was... Uh, or trainable. Certainly, uh, uh, yeah, you could live very comfortably, I think, with a vervet monkey that you'd raised from very small. But it's not to be advised, as I'm sure Jamie was saying to you. Yeah, I was hoping to find some sign of Karula through here, but I haven't. That's not to say she isn't here. Ah, now Lauren. You want to know how many kinds of monkeys there are here? Well, strictly speaking, only one monkey. I suppose you might consider the Chakma baboon a kind of a monkey, so that would be two. Uh, you might consider some of the people we work with monkeys, so that would be three species of monkey. Uh, but no, only the one, and that is the vervet monkey. The only other monkey we get in South Africa is a Samango monkey, which looks very similar and lives in the forests, up on the Drakensberg and down into Natal. But anywhere where there's a proper forest versus a woodland like this, you will find the Samango monkey. And you want to know if any of the predators like to eat them? Absolutely they do. Um, monkeys are highly prized by leopard. They will like to eat them. They're just quite difficult to catch because they're very wily. They live in a group. They warn each other if there's a predator coming along. But yes, leopards love to eat them. Um, lions will eat them if they can catch them, but they're not normally maneuverable enough to catch monkeys. Eagles also, um, crowned eagles enjoy eating monkeys. That's basically the mainstay of their diet in many areas. Just looking up there, I saw a very large bird. Ah, now Joey, good question from you. You say, what happens if a guest is caught feeding a monkey? Normally what they're done is, what's done is that at dawn you take them out and you tie them to a post um, in the middle of the staff village and then flog them. That's normally what we do to guests who feed monkeys. Um, sometimes we leave them out in the bush on their own for a while um, to contemplate the consequences of their actions. Um, sometimes we deny them food. It just depends on the actual case, Joey. Um, obviously that's all completely facetious. What we do do, I mean, you can't do anything. You just have to beg and plead and say, oh, thank you so much for coming, but please don't feed the monkeys. <laughs> you have to do that if somebody's paying in excess of 10,000 rand a night for the pleasure of your company. But it is, uh, sometimes you have to try, you have to try and be firm, but polite at the same time and it's not always very easy to be polite when you've said to somebody please don't feed the monkeys because we'll have to shoot them 
That, that normally does it. If you tell, if people say, well, why can't we feed them? They're so cute. When you explain that eventually they become a hazard to human beings and then they have to be put down, that normally uh, sort of stops them doing it. Which is amazing, though, how <laughs> it, doesn't, it just doesn't sink in. Jamie reckons that the best part of having a tail would be, able, be a, being able to tell people's moods. Um, well, I suppose if we wag them in the same way that we wag the dog's wag tails, then that could be the case. I think I would probably still look to people's faces to get their mood. Let's go across to Jamie and find out if she's grown a tail since we last saw her. No tail just yet, and I have to tell you, I'm a little bit disappointed that I am lacking a tail. The more we talk about it, the more... Oh! How very interesting. Seems as though James and I have had some very similar thoughts. Hold on one moment, the tail conversation I imagine will continue. <laughs> There's a termite mound there. I, uh, d I'm uh, actually quite impressed. I was overwhelmed by the, the sight of your beauty that I became... Disoriented. Briefly, yes. <laughs> it wasn't the, the enjoyment of the monkey tail conversation. No, I was a bit shocked by that. Ah, yeah, okay. Yeah, I, um, I found it shocking to ah, think that right. you and Vian want to have tails. I think it would be amazing if it was normal. <laughs> Imagine all the things you carry your tea. Well, that, that I did agree with and yep. I did pick that up with you. Good. Right. Uh, any sign of anything? Yes, all the signs of everything. Yes. Where they went, Where they totally went, yeah. different story. No, I have had the same problem. Lion and a lion crossed out at Shimam Road. Okay. Karula, I think, has crossed out as well. Um, Shadow is banished into thin air. Right. And the wild dogs may never have existed. Right. Good. Okay. So hugely successful. I'm going to leave you to your terrifying, graceful okay. dismount. Yes, thank you. Uh, my, my leg is getting very sore. Depressing, on the break. Depressing the break. Okay, well, let's, let us hurry on <laughs> and allow you to go backwards. Please don't go backwards into me. <laughs> Bye. Connor was roughly scarlet in colour at that point. <laughs> Shame. Right, so a hugely successful morning all around and you've sort of got my updates now from what I've been chatting to James about. One of the lines we tracked crossed out. We had reports of a female leopard crossing out of Juma into Torchwood, which was probably Karula, but assumptions are always a dangerous thing. As for where the rest of the lines have gone, I have no idea. I shared a joke with Ephraim on the Game Drive comms because nothing has been found this morning by any of us. And we shared a little bit of a chuckle about the fact that we have no idea what the lions are doing today. They walk... Oh no, there's lion tracks here now. James. These are old. I think you probably spotted them, that they're old lion tracks. He did not miss something. The lions apparently were on some kind of mission last night. Probably hungry and looking for food. Whether or not they managed or succeeded to catch anything is a different question. As to where they may be, again, it's very difficult. If you've got a fresh set of tracks on one side of the property, if you've got a fresh set of tracks on another side of the property, and a, a gap somewhere in the middle, it's really difficult to know which ones are fresher when you can't compare with the other person. It just becomes incredibly difficult. So the lions have, I think they plotted last night, I think they sat down and had a little conversation went, how can we confuse these people to the point that they don't know whether they're coming or going? And they split off in different directions and they went backwards and forwards and they went round and round in circles and then they had a good chuckle and lay down somewhere in the shade away from the roads. That is my only conclusion as to what happened last night. Alternately, somebody with a leopard footprint stamp went out last night and stamped all over the show just to and, or, and a lion and a leopard track just to confuse us. Or they walked backwards. All of these are, seem to be, at this point, relative possibilities in my mind. I 
and on the subject of a very very quiet morning Nacho would like to know if we usually see more animals in the morning or in the evening I think it roughly equals out Nacho the morning for me is my favorite time to be out because you're starting with a blank canvas so to speak you've got fresh and undriven roads the animals have been wandering around all night so you start off with a really nice base layer to work off and then of course you establish you set the scene for the afternoon so i don't i don't necessarily think we see more in the mornings or at, in the afternoons animals are more active early in the morning and they're more active late when the sun is starting to go down so those are your best times to look for animals but i don't think there's a particular we just have personal preferences i prefer the mornings in terms of coming out there's something about that excitement the mystery of what happened last night even if like today we never solved it although never say never the morning hasn't isn't over yet but even if we never actually figure out exactly what happened that mystery and the excitement is something that I find incredibly enjoyable. And the, the afternoons come with their own completely different atmosphere and feeling to them. I think though generally guides actually prefer to be out in the morning. And it's lovely... Did you see that, Viv? I'm very glad that was the VR rig. <laughs> I drove over a stick and I obviously drove over it that it got it at exactly the right angle and it flipped into my bonnet just missing the virtual reality rig. Thank goodness. Might have tapped it ever so slightly. That was totally unexpected and unfortunately just, just, just out of the view of the camera. I've hit myself before like that. Flinging sticks up into my face. I've even nearly once or twice hit the hit the cameraman I can't even remember I've lost my train of thought now surprise launch oh I remember Nacho who is a new viewer I've definitely never answered a question from you either and it's lovely to have so many new viewers joining us on these live safaris it's always lovely to have viewers in general um, Nacho would like to know if we've ever had an animal chase the car yes I I've had quite a few animals chase the car the biggest threat to us out here in terms of us in vehicles is an elephant um, and it's, but it's, it's very important to behave in a completely respectful and a constantly alert manner around them. No matter how relaxed they are, we're constantly busy reading their body language because they are several tons of animal and this is their home, which is one of my favourite things to say. It's difficult driving away from an elephant. I, I try and do it, you, there's a point at which you can't because you could provoke them to chase you and it's very very dependent upon the circumstances now generally we try and stand our ground but if we're in a, a dangerous situation if there's a threat to us or a threat to the elephant then we immediately move off and almost invariably that elephant has given you signs that it wants you to go away and if you can you should listen to those as soon as possible if an elephant tells you to go away you don't try and follow them you leave them come back the next day perhaps they'll be in a better mood you don't know what's happening in that animal's life I've been charged by lions in the vehicle before, not here. I've never been charged by a lion here. Um, I've been charged by a leopard once, that was live during a school show. And that was Karula, who was having a very, very bad day. And she just decided she was thoroughly upset with our presence. And then you leave that animal. And most of the time we are completely safe in the open vehicle. The only thing that is with uh, there are some really limited limited examples of lions and leopards going into cars but it's basically unheard of oh and i've been chased not here but i have been chased by a black rhinoceros before interesting experience that because they're quite small but at the same time they're quite they give you the impression of being very very cross when they're running at you and snorting my definitely one of my favorite animals just by the way Elephants are the most dangerous. I've heard of people being chased by giraffe before. I've even seen a video of it, which must be a very, a truly bizarre experience because giraffe are pretty much the most docile animals out here. They are completely innocuous, but they are huge. And then we had, we did have Nacho, one very interesting incident. Interesting is perhaps not the correct description. Hair raising might be a better way of phrasing that, where we, two weeks ago, was it two weeks ago or three, I can't remember now, 
we were on our live safari and the lions came racing out and they caught a buffalo in front of us and the position that we were in I thought they were going over the other side of the drainage line but they didn't they they actually came out into a sort of an island and the next thing I knew there was a, a buffalo running at us with a lion on its back and lions on either side of me and I had to get out of there very very quickly so that was relatively hair raising as things go but he wasn't running he was running de in desperation he wasn't attacking us that's very important to clarify he wasn't attacking us he was scared, he was being hunted, he knew that he, there was a good chance and he was killed in the end of all of that and he was desperately looking for somewhere to hide behind and in his desperation he ran to the car I've had hyenas try and hide, hide underneath my car before lions playing peekaboo around my car we, get, we have some interesting times out here but it's very very important to remember that if an animal is chasing you it wants you, it's doing that for a reason and it's time for you to go away. Often at high speed, sometimes at high speed. But we do our absolute utmost. We really, really do to make sure that we don't disturb the animals or upset them in any way. That of course is if there are animals here. There have to be animals here. I don't know where they've gone. I think we'll just have to, well, the day's not over, but if we don't find anything before the end of the sunrise safari, well, as dispatch said, somewhat preemptively, a couple of weeks ago, it might just be the calm before the storm on, today is Saturday, right? Yes. So it's in theory, Saturday, cat day. The cat days have been, the cats have been avoiding us on the Saturday cat day, which is exactly what they did before the lion hunt. So perhaps dispatch, if you could um, send us a message to say this is the calm before the storm, perhaps it will bode well. Oh. There were some Dacre there. There is a Dacre there. Just the way we started off our sunrise safari. Okay. You never know, we could come around the corner, there could be a lion in the road, or a leopard, or an impala. Or anything. This also makes the live safaris fun, because you can't have an amazing day, or amazing drive, every drive, First of all, we'd get spoiled. Second of all, it takes the fun out of working for it. And third, it makes those special moments even more special. Live lion hunts, lion fights, leopards around. And I know that that is a sentiment that Mr. Henry shares with me. The fact that you can't have a, a, a brilliant drive every drive. And speaking of Mr. Henry, let us jump on the back of Wendy with Connor and with Xander. <laughs> That's a defeatist talk from Jamie there. Um, I have to agree with her, yes. The quiet drives do make the more action-packed ones that much more special. Let's just look at this tree. This is the Inkahuma tree. We couldn't find the Inkahuma pride, so I found you the Inkahuma tree. Ha 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 ha. It's a brown ivory, and I was just wondering if these were new leaves already. But they appear to be old ones that haven't fallen off yet. Because this tree got leaves late last year. I always think they are such pretty trees. If you look at the trunk there, down a bit, Eggsy, you can see where it's been scratched. It looks like lions out to me that have jumped up onto the tree and scratched down and used it as a scratching post. So there were lions here at some stage, could have been months ago could have been last night. What we do know is that they are not here right now. Connor, get back on the car. The engineer is getting so bored, everybody. He goes for a walk every time I stop the car. I'll just leave him out here, find his own way home.
Hello Fiona, you're in Surrey. Nice to hear from you. I hope you're having a lovely Surrey summer's day. Uh, Surrey in summer is delightful when it isn't raining for the three days of the year that the clouds don't deluge on you. Um, you want to know about why, how Wendy this car got her name. Um, as far as I'm aware, because I keep forgetting the answer to this question, as far as I'm aware it's previous owner named it and I think after her wife, his wife, I think that's how she got her name. She is a deeply aged and deeply um, moody would be a kind way to put it. Um, recalcitrant old bag would be a more accurate way of putting it. You won't believe what I've just spotted Zander. Guess. It is an Impala. Well done. It's through there. It's about 75 miles away. Can you see it? You can't, can you? No. It's too far. Never mind. We'll find another one. Well, not probably not this morning, but we might find another one at some stage. Rusty got its name from Viam. I don't know if he told you that. He was the first one to look in her engine, uh, open up the, <laughs> the water, <laughs> put his finger in, pull it out, and it was bright red with iron oxide. He said, this thing is called Rusty now. And from then on, it was called Rusty. There were all sorts of names that came, were come up with, but Rusty just seemed to fit so well. There is the bird of prey, or a hornbill, one of the two. Hello Michael, a good question from you, you're 13 years old, a budding young ornithologist, and you say, do we get fish eagles here? We most certainly do. The African fish eagle is found in the Sabi sand, you say you know it's found in the Kruger. Well, we are actually part of the Kruger. And so, yes, you can find them here. We didn't have a huge amount of water, but the last ones we saw were at the Arethusa Dam, and there were many there. There's a grey hornbill over there that I'm trying to get a view of. Normally make this much effort to get a view of a grey hornbill, but for the fact that, um, well, not a great deal else to look at. That's it, Eggsy. Well done. Is that the end of the lens? Good grief. There he is. See how beautifully coloured he is for this vegetation? You wouldn't even notice him if you drove past here looking for leopards. Well done, Eggsy. Let us continue. This is where Jamie's been looking for shadow all day and I was just saying to the fellows on the back of the car, it would be a great injustice, but one that I would appreciate greatly, were the leopard that Jamie's been following all day to step out on the road in front of me. And likewise, uh, were the lions that I've been following to step out in front of Jamie. She's somewhere around here. She ain't called Shadow for nothing. Also, I'm slightly amazed by the lack of elephants today. Now, a question all the way from the Channel Island of Jersey. Nice to hear from you, thank you. I think it's Soraya and Dr. Rob, is that correct? I'm going to say it is. And so, uh, secretary birds. You're wondering about secretary birds and whether we find them here or not. Uh, we do find them. Chances of a sighting today very small because we normally find them on very open areas like the airstrip at Arethusa. That's where we'd normally find a secretary bird. Areas like this uh, are not great. Woodland areas for two reasons. First of all, um, they like to hunt in the long grass. They hunt snakes largely and when they find them they stomp on them. 
And secondly, a secretary bird is heavy and I've watched them try and fly and get off the ground quickly. And they either have to have quite a long runway to run on or they need to take off into the wind because they're quite heavy. And so you can imagine if we look off to the left hand side there, a secretary bird trying to take off quickly in amongst all of that vegetation, I think they'd find it quite difficult. So I think that's why, um, well those are the two reasons, or two of the reasons that they're found normally in open areas. I'm just scanning down through this valley. And seeing, well, some trees. And a termite mound or two. And that's about it. Right, let us continue exiting. The term flogging a dead horse comes to mind. It is amazing how open it is here. Now that the, oh, and there are the tracks that Jamie was following, the lion tracks. Where they've gone, well, we just cannot say. Quite looking forward to having Herbert back to help us on Tuesday. Christopher, what a nice question from you in Arizona again. You say, have I had to sacrifice anything uh, to follow the dream of becoming a guide? Um, I guess it depends very much on your perspective. You ain't going to become rich doing what I do, but that's fine. Uh, you, and by rich, I mean, I don't mean you're going to starve to death by any stretch of the imagination, but you're not going to make the money that a banker makes, for example, uh, or a, a lawyer. Um, yeah, so you're not going to make that kind of income. But every single day, Christopher, I get up in the morning and I look at the sunset rise that we show you, and every night before uh, the end of drive I watch the sun go down, and to me, that more than makes up for it. So, I mean, depends what your priorities are. I don't have a family at the moment, so I don't have to send kids to private schools and um, make sure that I own a large house and that sort of thing. Um, I don't not have a family because I live out here, if you know what I mean. Uh, that's just how things have turned out. So. I don't feel I've sacrificed at all by being out here. I suppose some might, but I guess then there are big sacrifices to being in the city uh, and working as a banker or a lawyer. And you get the big paycheck, but there are distinct disadvantages. So nice one, Christopher. I just think it depends on A, your priorities, and B, uh, what your, your level of tolerance and what you're prepared to live with. I mean, I did go back to the city and I taught as a guitar teacher, and while that was satisfying-ish work, it wasn't um, anything like as satisfying as this. So no, I would say I'm doing quite the opposite of sacrificing to be a guide. I think the big thing for many people is what do you do afterwards? So I mean, well, I'm now pushing 40, um, so there isn't really an afterwards for, uh, for me as far as this goes, because this is a nice progression for me. Many young people come into the bush sort of early 20s and they do this for a few years and then they don't know what, then, then there's the question of what else do you do. I've luckily come across this as presenting, it's different from the kind of lodge guiding. And one of the reasons that people ask that question of course is, well what do I do if I get married and I want to have kids, can I have them in the bush? And that, that's difficult because it's not easy to get to schools, it's not easy for the lodges, especially the smaller ones, uh, to cope with, uh, unless your you know, husband and wife team is employed together, it's quite difficult to cope with them having a family at the lodges. And so, yeah, I mean, that it's not, it's not an easy one to cope with. So I know many friends who've gone back to the city because they want to have a family, and because they want to, you know, live in a place where they can have a family. Yeah. I know many who've had families in the bush and managed to survive very well with them. So it just it depends on your sort of unique situation, I guess. I hope that kind of answers your question. 
All right, I can smell Amanda's uh, bacon on the skillet as we speak. Sm smells very delicious. But before I'm able to put that into my beak, I must say two things. The first thing is uh, goodbye to all of you, and thank you especially for your conversation today. I, I've, the three hours has flown past, and that's because uh, not because I've managed to find anything of great worth, but because all of you said uh, or gave us some great questions and comments. So thank you to all of you for taking the time to watch. The second thing I need to say before I say goodbye is a very happy birthday to Mrs. Wallington who is uh, turning uh, I think it's 22 today Mrs. Emily Wallington wife of Graham the creator and uh, so happy birthday Emily we'll hand you back to Jamie for the last few minutes and see you this afternoon bye bye and so we have reached the end of our sunrise safari and as James made mention the smell of Amanda's cooking is beckoning us home. We've done one last circuit to try and see if these lions have popped out somewhere here, but there is absolutely no sign of them. So just to finish off what James has been talking about, first of all, a very big happy birthday to Emily Wellington. I hope that you have an amazing day, Emily, and that perhaps we get to see you once again at some point coming to visit us or vice versa. Hope it's been a magical day spent in Johannesburg. And then we get to Christopher's question, just before we get to the end of the sunrise safari, which is a very good one, and it is, do you sacrifice anything in order to follow your dreams to come out here and work as a safari guide? And the answer, I think James has, has summed up my feelings pretty well as well. There's certain, yes, you sacrifice certain things, and certainly, don't get me wrong, the benefits by far outweigh the negatives and the sacrifice that you make. I think seeing your family, I mean, I'm a lot older than my brother, and I've spent a lot of time being nomadic, which means I've missed quite a few stages of his growing up. He went from when I left home to, to now. He's sort of gone from a teenager, early stage teenager, to an adult. And it's quite a scary transition that I'm sad that I missed out on seeing. But at the same time, I do. it's not like I never get to see them. Our leave schedules are very, very accommodating in that sense. To head home and to go and spend a little bit of time with one's family. And yes, certainly, you'll never be rich. You might sacrifice a little bit of sleep in summer, especially if you are a safari guide working with guests. You spend a considerable period of time with them, long, long days. But again, think of the things you get to do in those long days and it makes it all worthwhile. And you are nomadic for a large portion of your life. You don't necessarily have a base. You move from place to place constantly packing up and shifting around. You, no matter how long you stay at a lodge, at some point you will move on and go on to different things. So settling down and having a home is something that you've got to be content to live without for a while. And whilst you might not have a home, you kind of have a ready-made family in the, in the form of the team that you work with. You inevitably become incredibly close because you work together, you see each other every day, socialize, live together, and that to me is one of the special things about the bush. I think I've learned more about people working out here than I did in the entire rest of my life combined. It gives you a fantastic opportunity to meet and associate with people that you might not otherwise in normal social situations. And then of course there's the fact that we live and work in the bush and see lions, leopards and elephants on a relatively regular basis. <laughs> Ali, I've had I've had some upset guests that feel as though they've been shortchanged by not by us not finding an animal. But at the same time, you've got to explain it properly, and it's very very seldom that people are not understanding about the fact that you, it's not a zoo. You can't drive up to each and every individual animals and know exactly where they are. So a lovely question from Ali. No, I've never had a really angry guest. I've sometimes had some some sad faces, disappointed faces but not necessarily angry. And so we come to the end of a lovely but somewhat quiet morning. The cat's drawing rings around us. Hopefully we'll follow up on them this afternoon for the sunset safari. So a big thank you to Viam for his wonderful camera work as always, as well as to Kirsty and to Jerry in final control. Jerry doing a marvelous job of directing. And then most importantly, a big thank you to our viewers, new and regular. It's always a pleasure having you on board and we look forward to seeing you in just a few hours. 
Bye-bye, everybody.